Okay, I'd like to bring this meeting to order, please, today, of, uh, April 25th, and it is now 2 o'clock, and so without further ado, I would like to um, recognize Reverend Jeffrey Guild. 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 Sorry about that. Okay. I didn't put my cheaters on, which I will do right now. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Well, this afternoon I have the privilege of praying for you and uh, for invoking God's presence on this meeting. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, giver and sustainer of life, the one who governs us in grace and mercy, we humbly come before you today to ask your blessing upon these office holders of the Pinellas County Commission, their staffs and those, I'm sorry, the, their staffs and, and those who keep our government running. We thank you for these servant leaders and ask you to strengthen them and keep them safe. We have been blessed by their good work and ceaseless commitment for which we give you thanks. Continue to grant them wisdom, enable them to work in the spirit of cooperation, kindness, and justice. May they use authority to serve faithfully in promoting the general welfare of our citizens. Watch over our first responders and all those engaged in making our community safe. O oh God, you have established order and rule so that we may enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Remind us that we who have been created equal and in your image our sisters and brothers. Please heal any division we have among us so that all people may prosper. You have given us the freedom to openly worship as we deem fit. We thank you for the diversity of faith among the peoples of this county and ask you to strengthen all communities of faith and bring unity of service to those who call upon your name. As in my tradition as a Christian pastor, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor Guile. Very welcome. Thank you so much for being here and for your time. All right, members, I would like to take a point of order, please, before we have our presentations and awards and ask if you would all please stand and join me in a moment of silence for the repose of the soul of George Campbell, loving husband of Pam Campbell, who passed away actually while I was in London and whose funeral was yesterday. May his soul rest in heavenly peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, everyone. <clears throat> All right, and so now we are going to have our presentations today. And the first one is, I would like to ask Carolyn Cheatham Rhodes, Urban Forester, Urban Forestry and Landscape Services, Matt Hill, Urban Forestry Management Specialist, Urban Forestry and Landscape Services, and Aaron Straziri, Environmental Specialist 3, Ecologist Ecological Services Unit, to please join me up here at the podium. Thank you for being up here today. They will be accepting the Joint Earth Day, Arbor Day proclamation. What? Oh. 
Our nation observes two days in April, Earth Day and National Arbor Day, to recognize the significance of protecting the environment and planting trees for a greener tomorrow. Earth Day was first observed in 1970 in California and Arbor Day in 1872 in Nebraska. Earth Day and Arbor Day are now observed throughout the nation and the world and 2023 is the 53rd anniversary of Earth Day and the 151st anniversary of Arbor Day. Resource conservation, waste reduction, and environmental protection are imperative to a sustainable future. Urban trees provide a variety of economic, environmental, and human health benefits, including filtering pollutants from the air, moderating temperatures in urbanized areas, and reducing stress levels. In Pinellas County, an estimated 100,000 street trees are worth over $300 million and estimated to provide more than $7.4 million in ecosystem benefits annually. Pinellas County Urban Forestry and Landscape Services will plant 250 trees to mark the year and gift more than 200 trees to county residents to celebrate Arbor Day. The integrity, health, and resilience of our interconnected human and natural communities depends on our understanding that humans are not separate from nature. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that April 22, 2023 be recognized as Earth Day and that April 28, 2023 be recognized as Arbor Day in Pinellas County, Florida, and urge all citizens to join me in supporting efforts to protect our urban trees, natural woodlands, and the resilience of our community by supporting our county's urban forestry and natural resource programs. Further, urge all citizens to plant trees to promote the well-being of present and future generations. And this proclamation is signed by all of the members of our county commission. There you go. Thank you so very much. We really appreciate uh, the presentation of the proclamation again this year. We're really proud to have um, just provided those 200 trees to our community in the uh, Ridge, at Ridgecrest Park. Uh, the past weekend, I uh, had a wonderful time delivering trees to our community members. We're going to have a small planting going in coming up this um, Arbor Day, on the National Arbor Day on Friday, and hope to have at least another 250 trees planted along our roadways before the end of the fiscal year. Wonderful. Thank you so much, and I did remind one of my commissioners as I came in this afternoon, it's all these lovely trees that give us the oxygen that we breathe, right? So there, it's important. So thank you so much for all the work that you do. You're welcome. Have a great day. Kit, can I split you guys in the middle? I've seen you on the side of the chair. Perfect. I'm going to do three shots. I would like to ask Bill Gorman, Vice Chair, and Lena Deli Paoli, Secretary, both with the Employees Advisory Council, to join me at the podium. What? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Me too. I do not see 
I know, where is she? Did she stand us up? Working hard. She must be working very hard and gotten tied up. So now we're, you're, you can enjoy the show all by yourself. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so the week of May 7th to the 13th, 2023, is recognized nationally as Public Service Recognition Week. Pinellas County employees, by working together, deliver first-class services to m nearly a million residents and more than five million residents annually. Pinellas County employees serve as active participants in the county's efforts to develop innovative methods of providing services in new and cost-effective ways. Pinellas County employees reach out to the community by volunteering their time and their talents. Pinellas County employees are working hard every day to be the standard for public service in America. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that the week of May 7th through the 13th be recognized as Public Service Recognition Week. We encourage all Pinellas County citizens to join us in recognizing our employees who work throughout the county, providing dedicated service and maintaining a standard of excellence of which we can all be very proud. And it's signed as well by all of the members of the county commission. <coughs> all right. So. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, all of the employees at Pinellas County work hard every day to work for the citizens at the will of the board, and we're, it's very nice to be acknowledged. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, and we're happy to acknowledge you. Thank you for being here. All right. And now we are on to number three, our citizens to be heard. And before we start, I would just like to let you know that we have an inordinate number of citizens here today who wish to speak. And I want to be able to give all of them an opportunity to be recognized and tell us what it is that they have to say. So unfortunately, I'm going to need to shorten the time allotted to two minutes instead of three just so that we still have time to complete our meeting today, uh, which is important as well. So without further ado, we have four UF students here this afternoon, and I would like to recognize them. Um, just hold on one moment. I'm looking for names. Caitlin Kometi. Caitlin, please come forward. Catherine Lewis, Shanice Rodriguez, and Lyle Leary. Do I have all that right? I hope. Please come forward. State, state your name, please, and your address for the record. And then you will have how many minutes? I'm asking if you want to give them a little letter to Yes. How many? Nine. So we'll give you eight minutes. I hope you can finalize your statements and still be powerful with your message. All right. All right? Who's going to begin? I am. Hello. 
And your name is? Caitlin Kometz. Um, I live at 200 6th Avenue. Come South. forward a little bit and the microphone. Pull your microphones into you this way so we can hear you properly. Hello. Perfect. My name is Caitlin Kometz. I live at 200 6th Avenue South, St. Petersburg, 33701. Um, and we are students from USF here to propose a community recycling program. The goal of this project is to make recycling more accessible to pedestrians by installing clearly labeled re recycling bins next to the city trash cans. When recycling services are not easily available, people are more likely to throw recyclables into the trash, which then contributes to the waste stream. This will not only decrease the number of recyclable materials that get thrown away, but will also further the city's goal of becoming net zero by 2050. St. Pete is already a beacon of environmental living, but giving citizens the opportunity to, opportunity to actively participate in this movement will increase the morale of the city and encourage businesses and, and individuals alike to support future environmental ventures and to live more environmentally conscious lives. Even if we were to put the environmental benefits to the side, this project will create jobs and clean up our city, increasing property values and tourism opportunities. We propose a pilot implementation of our proposal on Central Avenue to determine the popularity and success of our project. Thank you. Thank you. Who is next? All right. Now, stand in the center, please, and pull that microphone on the right over to, there you go. Now you have them both in the middle. All right, okay. there you go. Okay. So the city of St. Pete currently has a- And six, your name? Oh, Catherine Lewis. And, and, and your- 200 6th Street South. Uh, Thank you. The city of St. Pete currently has a successful residential recycling program that includes curbside pickup and easily accessible recycling guides online. This system has shown good results with 69% of home homeowners participating. Um, this does not, however, cross over in regards to public recycling options, including large apartment buildings, which are considered to be buildings over four units. St. Pete does not offer recycling collection for commercial areas either, leaving businesses in heavily walked areas to completely manage their waste, both in terms of hiring pickup and funding said pickup. This discourages people from recycling when they, do not, when they have to go out of their way to drop their waste somewhere else. As we know, businesses are huge waste producers, and by adding recycling options for them to be included, then we can cut back on large amounts of additional unnecessary waste. Hello. Hi. And um, your name I'm is? I'm Shanice Rodriguez, and I live at 8192 Hardy Bay Loop. Um, so basically, recycling is one of the simplest and most common ways in which humans can help clean the environment. Um, according to the EPA, 75.5% of waste goes to landfills, 15.8% um, go to incinerators, and only 8.7% is actually recycled. Landfills and incinerators, they have a large burden on the emissions um, of toxic pollutants. Incinerators, they leak, them into the, they leak the toxins into the air. Um, landfills, they transfer the toxins through groundwater. So obviously increasing recycling would reduce the amount of waste that's used in landfills and incinerators, and basically overall pollution. Recycling would also help with the better management of its resources. Because we are recycling items and reusing them, um, we won't have as much of a need to cut down trees and mine for minerals. So with this benefit, a major chunk of the pollutants that we emit into the air and waters would be reduced, especially the ones that are um, exposed from mining and deforestation. So adding more recycling bins around the St. Pete area would make recycling more efficient and accessible to um, citizens. And it would have um, a ton of environmental long-term benefits and also it would protect overall human health because lowering the amount of pollutions ex uh, pollutants exposed would also lower the amount of pollutants that reach humans and cause diseases and overall death. Okay. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Your name? So I'm Kyle Leary, and I live at 7287 Mayaka Valley Trail. Okay, so the cost of this here will vary depending on the type of recycling bins purchased. It, from the cheapest to most expensive, it'll be between Five hundred and five thousand dollars, but for but for the type that's probably needed, it'll be between likely between one and one and a half thousand dollars. For example, a Widman Widman collection thirty-six gallon recycling receptacle costs just under one thousand four hundred dollars. If bins are added to every block of Central Avenue between First Street and 
18th Street, it'll cost between 18 and $27,000. And if they're placed between every other street, it'll be between nine and thirteen and a half thousand dollars and if they're placed and if they're placed every fourth street it'll be between four and a half thousand and six thousand seven hundred fifty dollars and and for the average refuge and recycling collector the pay is between fifteen and twenty an hour so assuming that there's three workers and collection takes two hours the cost should be between ninety and one hundred twenty dollars every every two weeks and place in the recycling bins around St. Petersburg has many economic, so social, and environmental benefits. And with growing concerns of population growth, there's a there's a need to take action to protect the citizens and the environment. Great, excellent. Thank you. Um, we've also left copies of our presentation for you guys to review if you'd like. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it very much. Uh, next, we have Nat, Matt Richards. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Matt Richards, 2051 Arbor Drive, Clearwater 33760. Hope everyone can hear me. Arbor Trace is a tiny homeowners association, 33 units built in the mid-1980s. It is bordered by Whitney Road on the north and, a and is about a five-minute walk to the former Tech Data campus to the east. Association has drawn a majority of its past and current homeowners, not necessarily by modest prices, but by the unique amenities we have. We are not a fancy, high-end, gated community. There are dozens, probably well over a hundred, mature oak trees directly on the property as well as on a wetlands area that borders the property to the east and south separated by Long Branch Creek. As you may imagine, the wetlands, wetlands provide a habitat teeming with wildlife, some probably protected species. In addition, there is a working horse farm bordering those same wetlands and Arbor Trace property as well in the middle of Pinellas County. Arbor Trace is, while concerned with the noise and multi-month disruption of a major roadway construction that is going to ensue directly in front of our property, the major concern is the current plan that uh, calls for removing most or all of a line of about 20 mature oak trees that form a, a tree line along the property line. I don't use the term mature lightly. Some of these trees are over 50 years old, maybe closer to 100 years. I grew up in Pinellas County when the term uh, development progress were to be cherished and respected, not to be challenged and questioned. I believe those times have changed. In honor of the upcoming Arbor Day celebration, help us save our trees. We invite you out to our property to look at what we are speaking of. I'm not sure how the camera thing works, but... Put it right over the seal. Right over the seal? Oh, the okay. other way. Uh, the other picture, way, turn it up. Picture, there you go. Right. There you, aren't they beautiful? Well, that's just a few of them. Beautiful. That's a few of the 20. So I uh, appreciate the time, and um, thank you. Thank you. Jill Sassone. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Thank you for having us. Welcome. My name is Jill Sassone, and I have been a resident of the Arbor Trace townhome community for 22 years. I was at the 2017 planning meeting as a resident, and I did express my concerns then. I followed up in 2018 and didn't hear anything beyond that. Um, some of you might be familiar with the beautiful southern live oak tree canopy on Bel Air Road, just west of US Highway 19. Um, our tree canopy is similar to that natural, iconic beauty. So that's what we're here today. We're here today talking and, and pleading and asking you to hit the pause button on this construction project and ask subject matter experts like Matt and Carolyn to be invited to the table so that we can take a look and really do what we need to do to, to celebrate Arbor Day and protect the trees <coughs> and the environment. I'm trying to reduce my time, so I've got 11 points I'm going to share. <laughs> The trees serve as our protection during Florida, frequent inclement weather, and hurricane events. Our subdivision has serious flooding issues. They protect our homes and property from both wind and storm damage. They provide critical shade for our homes from the severe Florida sun, decreasing energy consumption and costs for residents. Our homes, these townhomes that we live in, have six by six and eight by eight 
glass sliders in every room of our home. So it's like we live in a tree house and the sun comes in. We see the beautiful trees. <coughs> the trees also provide noise abatement from frequent and heavy traffic noise, vehicle lights, and the street lamp lights all on Whitney Road. It would take decades to grow trees this large if they are, if they are intended to be removed. It costs a lot of money and ongoing irrigation maintenance expenses to replant and establish new trees, and that's if it can be successful. We don't know if it would be successful. Trees uptake nutrients in the stormwater, which would otherwise travel into Tampa Bay or the Gulf. Excess nutrients in the water is the main cause of algae blooms like red tide, which the county is battling and spending thousands of dollars on annually. Thank you. Is my time up? Your time Thank you. is up. I'm so sorry, Thank but you. I think we get the message. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, Debbie Lepa. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is it just the one picture or? If you flip it over though. Turn up, turn it oh, up. flip it over. There you go. The camera's above you. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for letting us speak today um, in honor of Arbor Day. Arbor, I, um, my name's Debbie Leppla and I live at 2011 Arbor Drive, Clearwater, Largo. Arbor Trace residents were completely blindsided by the Whitney Wolford Road intersection plan as the main attraction to living there are the many live oaks both within the community and along Whitney Road. These trees are at least 50 years old and cannot be replaced. More than the aesthetics of having these trees remain in front of our neighborhood or the environmental impacts this will have on us from the fact that the trees clean the air, act as a wind barrier to protect our homes, and also act as a filter uh, to, to reduce traffic noise. They are moving Whitney Road 20 feet closer to our homes as part of this plan and removing all the tree line. Not good. According to the Environmental and Natural Resource Protection Chapter of the Pinellas County Municipal Code, specifically referring to permit applications for tree removal, Section 166-83E, 4 through 8, states, the county administrator shall consider the potential for significant adverse effects in the following areas on the urban and natural environment in granting a permit and meeting the other provisions of this article. Noise pollution. Whether the removal of trees or other protected vegetation will significantly increase ambient noise levels to the degree that a nuisance is anticipated to occur. Yes. Air quality. Whether the removal of trees or other protected vegetation will significantly affect the natural cleaning of the atmosphere by vegetation. Yes. Wildlife habitat. Whether the removal of trees or other protected vegetation will significantly reduce available habitat for wildlife existence and reproduction. Yes. Aesthetic degradation. Whether the removal of trees or other protected vegetation will have an adverse effect on property values, most definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Uh, next is Jane DeZara. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, my name is Jane DeZona. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no problem. Hey, hey how are you, Dave? Good. How are you? <laughs> Fine, thanks. Um, and I live at 2020 Arbor Drive. Let's see, I guess I have shown this picture. Is that showing up? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, not to be repetitive, I'll jump through some of the points I was going to make. Um, obviously, these are a main feature of our, of our neighborhood. There are, as everybody mentioned, up to 50 on our site. The current plan calls for getting rid of all the trees on the one side between the road and the sidewalk. And you can see in this picture, they're massive, beautiful, gorgeous oaks. They need to redesign and refuel the whole thing so that it does not remove all those oak trees. There is a way that they can do it by putting their, the um, drainage underneath the road. And we strongly hope that is the route that they'll go rather than tearing down all of our oak trees and creating um, a lot of noise for our community. Whitney in the evening is like a raceway. You might as well be trying to camp at Daytona Raceway. <laughs> it's motorcycles and muscle cars racing up and down the street. And it's the trees are the only thing 
that are buffering it to some degree. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I have Deborah Ward, but I understand, Deborah, you have waived your right to speak this afternoon. Is that accurate? Yes. yes. All right. Thank you so much. Um, do you want to waive in support of everyone that's already spoken? <laughs> yes. Okay. I thought so. He's wearing the shirt. Yeah. Well, I'm just double checking. All right. And now we have, um, oh gosh, let's see. Marjorie Boulone. Is that, did I say that right? And if it's okay, um, we're both speaking on the same topic, can we come up together? Well, are you both going to speak or one of you is speaking for both of you? We're both going to speak similar to what the USS students did. All right, then why don't you come on up and move that to four? Yeah. If we could combine the time, so we'll have four minutes. Correct. He okay. didn't do a card. Madam Chair, he didn't fill out a card. Do you, did. did you did. fill out yes. a card? Yes. You yes. did? Right. Dennis I apologize. Peckowitz. It's only good. I'm sorry? Dennis, Dennis. Peckowitz. Dennis. No, I don't have a card for you, Dennis. Oh, yes, I do. It's in a different spot. I apologize. Uh -huh. Okay, got it. Okay. So, um, my name is Marjorie Ballone. I live at 12455 102nd Avenue North in Unincorporated Seminole. Um, Dennis? My name is Dennis Petkowitz. I live at 11791 102nd Avenue North, Seminole. Um, we were active participants in 2007 in the community effort to avoid widening 102nd to a four lane thoroughfare. You remember that. So we're reconvening our getting the old band back together, as I like to say, and community organizing once again related to the 102nd Avenue proposed roadway improvements. Um, part of those improvements includes a 12-foot wide multi-use um, pathway connecting the Pinellas Trail to Walsingham Park. Um, there are two sides to 102nd. One side, um, essentially, that pathway would traverse 30 driveways. Um, and would take up away a whole bunch of oak trees um, that are along the drainage ditches, which provide um, absorption of road water runoff. We have um, drainage ditches with um, culverts underneath driveways. Uh, drainage works very well the way that it is. Um, it allows us to have green shoulders on the road. And we have no curb or gutter along the roadway, which allows the mailman to deliver 30 mailboxes along that street. The proposal calls for curb and gutter along that thoroughfare. Also, things like um, first responders park on the shoulders when they need to access houses that have long driveways. Um, the mailman, obviously, uses the shoulder so he doesn't block traffic on 102nd as a thoroughfare would not have access with curb and gutter to those shoulders. I'm not sure how mail would get delivered. Um, and service vehicles, delivery trucks, things of that nature, all use the shoulder to get out of the, the roadway and allow traffic to continue to flow. Among the other proposals for the roadway improvements, in addition to this multi-use pathway and the curb and gutters and improved drainage, are um, changes or potential signaling or roundabouts at Ridge Road and 125th. Back in 2007, the remnants of the project after it got canceled were to look at signaling at 125th. Um, that never occurred. Some of the other remnant projects did occur, continuation of the sidewalk um, east of um, Wintry Oaks to connect it up to the trail. Um, repaving of 102nd and um, uh, several other things like uh, pedestrian activated crosswalks from the south side of 102nd into Walsingham Park and then further down into the equestrian park and those work very well and we appreciate the county doing those projects. Um, we're very early on in this project but we wanted to express our our concerns and also to let you know that we've already been in discussions with Tom Washburn yeah. and Rob um, Medor, um, as well as the project manager, Kathy Fernandez. Um, Dennis wants to speak a little bit about the trail crossing because he lives right next to it. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Marjorie. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, so I've lived on that spot for 40 plus years, back when Pinellas County Trails was still a railroad. Uh, been through lots of hurricanes, tropical storms, we've never had any issues with flooding. Uh, my property is like right on 102nd Avenue, so I get a first-hand uh, view of what's happening. Uh, the thoughts of putting in a roundabout on Ridge Road have some uh, res reservations about that uh, because it would uh, cause a blockage for traffic coming in. And I was there once and it got rear-ended when people started to stop. So uh, looking forward to working with leadership in Pinellas to uh, do some more planning. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jim Hunt. Jim Hunt. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Jim Hunt. Uh, I live at 2001 Arbor Drive in Clearwater. It's, it's in Largo, but it's a Clearwater mailing address. I've been living at the Arbor Trace Homeowners Association for 18 years now. I'm a retired highway engineer. Uh, we met in the field last week with Rob Metter and uh, Scott Baird, two of you people from uh, uh, production or for, from Public Works. We're interested in, in saving our tree boundary or our tree buffer between our development and Whitney Road. The, the current design is moving the road about 20 feet further to the south, closer to our property line, and it's covering up the existing ditches that's out there. And they're proposing a, a large diameter storm sewer that will go about 15 feet further south from where the existing ditch is. And essentially that's going to clear, clear all the trees that are our current buffer. Uh, we talked to Rob and to uh, Scott last week and they're considering some minor design changes which would incorporate, move the storm sewer back into where the existing ditch is, which would be underneath the pavement to a certain extent. And, and converting the uh, typical section to a curb and, curb and gutter section on our side, which will help to remove the, uh, the impact to the trees. And all we're asking is that your consideration for those minor design changes to save our buffer. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lindsay Camacho. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Lindsay Camacho, uh, 4065 20th Avenue, uh, North St. Petersburg. Uh, thanks for letting me speak. As a military veteran, I believe in the chain of command. Please know I've exhausted every opportunity to work within the system. Unfortunately, my interactions with the senior county staff has not yielded the best results. I've communicated with Charles Mangio and Paul Seiko, Solid Waste Director. Now I'm coming to my elected representatives to help me solve an access issue. Through a handful of emails with Mr. Seiko, I was told that the public bathrooms were closed indefinitely due to COVID, people parking in front of the building on the exit road, and vandalism. Mr. Seiko's permanent solution was to place two portalettes out by the public parking at a cost of $350 a month to include two, two times a week cleaning for 1,400 to 1,500 customers a day. While I don't have all the details on the cost, it seems like a duplication of services when there are working restrooms. The vandalism was an act of a vile person. However, it has only happened three times in 20 years. We were told the restrooms were closed due to co the COVID state of emergency. I don't need to remind the body of those of us in, of in, of us in, in, in sanitation could not stay home. We showed up every day to keep the county, cities clean and functioning. Now that the pandemic is officially over, having access to functioning restrooms seems only fair. Excuse me. Coming out of the pandemic, we learned how critical hand washing is. However, we no longer have access to working sinks. My truck is my office. I'm, I'm certain your office has functioning restrooms. I'd never ask you to eat your lunch without the opportunity to wash your hands. Maybe I'm missing the mark on this, but certainly feels like a basic human right to me. I'm not asking for a new facility, just asking that you simply unlock the existing facility taxpayers have worked so hard to pay for. Lastly, as you can see in the pictures, don't know if you got them. From an ADA perspective, I see that the one, with portal, one of the portalettes is compliant. However, I note that there is no self-navigation path to it. However, this temporary emergency solution is not suitable for a permanent restrooms that exist 300 feet away. 
Not, out, not always celebrated as such, but sanitation workers are heroes too. We showed up for you every day, our community. Today, we need you to be our heroes. Thank you. Thank Sorry. you. Can you tell us? Thank you very much. We can you tell us where you're, what yeah. site you're talking about? Pinellas County Solid Waste. So, waste energy plant. Yeah, the waste facility okay. as you drive in. Pictures, I don't know if you've seen. Do I want, should I put them up here or today. pass them? Um, okay. Yeah. I, I just needed to know what, what site you were talking about. Sorry. Yeah, I'd like so to we, see it. Do you want to yeah. put it on the screen? Sure. So this is a, an overview, basically. Um, this would be the entrance. There's three, three lanes in and three right. lanes out. Here's the public restrooms, and these are the portalettes currently. Um, people do park there, I get it, but parking is right here. So if that's just enforced, you could stop people from parking there. This is a hot pad. Big truck can park there out of the way. Um, and then this is what they look like now. This is what's there currently. You can see that's the exit right there. Um, this is a picture of the building, the distance. I mean, it's about 300 feet. And then this is a picture of what you would see from the road. There's really no access for anybody. If they needed a wheelchair, it doesn't affect me, but it may affect someone. And that's just a close up. Thank you. Thank sorry. you very much. Sorry, it took no, so much thank time. You. Sorry, thank you for apologies. bringing it to our attention. Yep. Thank you so much. Yep. And, uh, Do you want any of this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Go take it. Um, Commissioner Peters. Thank you. Barry, I saw you taking notes. Is this something we're going to follow up on? Because yeah, I have no idea the fact what it that is. they don't have washing sinks is a real problem. Yeah. And uh, and I just, I'd like you to look into that a little bit. Yeah, this is the first I've heard of it. I mean, Paul Sacco's here. I, I could bring him up, but I'd rather uh, just talk, look into to, talk to them and get back to you. Yeah. Thank, I'd appreciate it if you'd follow up, though. Yep. Thank you for coming and letting us know. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, next is Renee Rivard. Um, from Cortez, Florida. Renee, good afternoon. Hello. Hello, Commissioners. Renee Rivard, Cortez, Florida. We want to thank Commissioner Flowers, Commissioner Justice, and Commissioner Eggers for wanting to help with the unwanted pet rabbit problem. Dogs and cats have been discussed for decades in Tampa Bay, but never rabbits, which are the third given up pet. We have not heard a single good reason for the four other commissioners not wanting to help. I can tell you who has had it up to their ears with pet stores bringing in animals from all over the world, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. I saw one of their meetings on the Florida Channel and one of their top guys said he would like to seal off Florida from anything being brought in. Foreign species can ruin our ecosystem and spread diseases. Another Pinellas commissioner said she had rabbits all over her neighborhood and the coyotes took care of them. If you have photos of these rabbits, I would like to see them. I'm willing to bet they were pet rabbits that were dumped outside and multiplied. Um, there have been colonies of dumped rabbits in Florida that have multiplied multiply to over 100 rabbits. Pinellas SPCA took in 345 unwanted pet rabbits last year. They euthanize 61 of them. They are a kill shelter. If they can't handle their intake, they kill. And for the commissioner who was complaining about people from outside the county, uh, In Defense of Animals is a national animal welfare organization with members in Pinellas County. You should welcome their expertise. Um, commissioners, Please do what you can to help because euthanasia and coyotes are not a solution to the unwanted pet rabbit problem. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Uh, next is Susan Hall. <coughs> I'm rushing, I know. Thank you. I'm Susan Hall. I am a volunteer with Suncoast House Rabbit Rescue and I've been here several times. I'm sure you're all sick of seeing me, but I'm not going to stop until I get some help for these bunnies. I uh, live in Pinellas County. I live in St. Petersburg on Dartmouth Avenue, have since 1987. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of the dumped bunnies, collectively between the House Rabbit Society, In Defense of Animals, all of our volunteers, we collectively have enough knowledge and expertise to qualify as expert witnesses in a court of law, yet we come in here, we explain the problem repeatedly, and then you, you all seem to, to think that, well, I don't know that the problem exists because I haven't heard of it personally. I heard this during the work meeting, 
and the solution to this problem is to educate. Well, we've tried that with every county, with every single ban in, in Hillsborough, Pasco, Duval, Key West, Orange County, California, New York. All of these areas have tried educating to no avail. The only thing that's going to stem the tide of bunnies being dumped outside to fend for themselves, which is completely unfair since we've modified their breeding and, and eliminated, for the sake of looks, how much that they have to defend themselves. So you take a black and white bunny and put them out there. They have no, no hope of, of escaping a, a, an attack from a coyote. And to think that that's funny just broke my heart. To hear somebody laughing about that just broke my heart. We take in these bunnies because nobody else does. You don't hear about it and you're not tagged in the, in the media because we are getting the tags. We're the ones grabbing the X-pens, the carriers, and the bananas and going out and crawling underneath mobile homes to catch bunnies to save them from being hit by cars either deliberately or accidentally. I'm the one that's out there at dusk on the, the intersection of US 19 and Drew Street in that unhoused people living there and trying to save those bunnies. And I need your help, please. I appreciate those of you that have said you will. And I appreciate going over time. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. David Balagettis, Jr. Hi, good afternoon, commissioners. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live at 802 Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Article 2, Section 1, and the 12th Amendment of this Constitution highlights the electors in this government as a militia of sorts, emoluments as being natural-born citizens, as being inhabitants of the same state within themselves, entitling themselves to hold office for profit as directed by legislature, claiming in Article 3, Section 2, to be citizens of the same state, claiming lands under grants of different states regarding equity arising under this Constitution in its capture of both land and water in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11. Article 6 exhibits this Constitution as being under this Constitution as being under the Confederacy and pursues such constitutional cross-dressing of such to be the supreme law of the land. I am here to say that legislation does not have the right to play constitutional <coughs> dress-up and candidly pretend to be something that, in fact, they're not and claim such political behavior to be of a legitimate process therein birthing such offspring in the 14th Amendment via some sort of act of constitutional sodomy of, of our society in its hold on truth. I have a grievance uh, against such political behaviors. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, the rest of these are either, oh wait, here's one more. Oh, Mr. Pound. Please come forward. Good afternoon. How are you? Fine. Greg Pound. I'd like to read um, this out of the Bible. This is Psalms chapter 45, verse 20, 21. It says, Yahweh preserves all them that love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of Yahweh the Lord. And let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. I want to speak on the issue of the pa of a pastor getting arrested at the abortion clinic on Highland in Bel Air a couple weeks ago. I've been going out there since 1975, and um, with Protestants, Catholics alike, we go out there faithfully. We've been there for years, and now the rights of people are being violated to be on a public sidewalk. That's been there. We've been doing this for years, trying to defend children. And so what we have is we have a massive, massive problem in the country, and our leaders need to stop it because you're bringing us under judgment. It says, you know, it's real simple. You know, they, it's sad to see what's going on, and you look in the paper, and it's what happened to the white culture? Why are the white people doing this? 
You know, they say if the white women don't uh, kill the baby, the white men molest them. Now, this is a real blot on our culture and we as a people. And so the only way we're going to reach, we're going to have to, we're going to have to stop this kind of stuff because we're bringing us under judgments. Go to Leviticus 20 and see what the Creator says about killing babies. I mean, it's all through the Bible. All you have to do is read it. And we're bringing ourselves and our nation under judgment. And this is a real plight. And um, so I just want to know why in Pinellas County, out of all the other counties you can go to, they don't arrest people for being on public sidewalks to defend people who are killing babies. And it's so crazy that the doctor there was, I guess he's got charged with trying to make a baby with one of the women he was aborting a baby with. And, um, you know, I, I guess... I mean, illegally. I mean, you can read this. He's either molesting the women that are having abortions and all this other stuff. This is downright insane. What, what happened to our culture, folks? Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Curtis Marsta, and Deborah, is he on the phone? Or Madam Clerk, do we have him on the phone? Madam, Madam Chair, we have David Waldo appearing via Zoom. Okay, yes, I have him next. You... David Waddell? Yes. Yes, his hand raised. We can unmute him. David, are you there? Mr. Waddell? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hello. How, hi, David. How are you? <coughs> good, good. Thank you, Commissioner Long. Um, I uh, reside at 4835 164th Avenue North, Clearwater, Florida, 33762. Today I'm here in my capacity as the uh, president of the Pinellas Groves Hamlet Citizens Committee. Uh, it was by coincidence today that uh, I wanted to speak to the issue of conservation. Uh, Barry, I think you'll remember about, uh, oh gosh, two or three years ago, and I think um, uh, Commissioner Long being in the resiliency uh, coordinator for our county, I wanna commend you for spearheading uh, that. But I wanna also bring to your attention, and I think about a month ago, I was, uh, referred to you through your assistant that uh, I actually table what's going on in our community. Uh, we, we have a devastating uh, impact of the, uh, from the lack of oversight from staff. Uh, Barry, you failed us uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, when you had the opportunity to purchase this property over uh, here at the Bayside uh, Reserves area. And what's happened is uh, it has impacted our community beyond measure. Um, the, this was all clear cut. The drainage program is screwed up. You've lost your easement. I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I spoke with Kevin yesterday. He intended to be there today. Jill, you've been here uh, since this has occurred, but it is, a, it is just a tragedy. We, we, our health, our safety, our welfare, and now our insurance and property values have been damaged. Barry, it's one of your biggest ball drops yet, pal. And I am sorry, but. I think the last time I spoke with you, I asked you to run this like a well-oiled machine. And you also then promised me your Inspector General's report on the Housing Finance Authority. That has not been followed up on. So we got some boxes here to check, but from a conservation standpoint, oversight with vegetation and habitat permitting on this project is just a shame. I invite you all to come out here and see uh, what we can do to implement corrective action, the necessary ordinances, and the people from Arbor Trace, thank you. You set the table today. Didn't even realize we'd be talking about trees. But what's happened in our community here is just another big failure. And Thank, uh, <coughs> thank the, you, the David. Your time is up now. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. It's nice to hear from you again. You too. You guys take care. Bye-bye, uh, Madam Clark. Uh, Diane Campbell, is she on Zoom as well? Yes, yes, Madam Chair, she is. Diane, are you there? Yes, yes, I am. Hi, would you please uh, give us your address and, and then proceed? Thank you, yes, my name's Diane Campbell. I live at 350 Barber Circle in Bel Air, Florida. Thank and you. thank you uh, for your time. I'm here to speak about two things, uh, please, uh, regarding the Pinellas County Trail. I encourage you strongly to keep a left-sided walkers, non-motorized trail um, lane only. I was injured in a motor vehicle accident and I have to wear a, a hard cervical collar for a total of 90 days. Um, not only will this um, left lane for walkers, non-motorized, uh, 
um, area be maintained. I know it used to be that way. I've been here for 34 years, but people with strollers, people who are disabled, whether it be physically disabled or mentally disabled, people with PTSD, these motorized vehicles whizzing by really um, can be a, a terrible danger. Um, and um, people use canes, uh, you know, people on the mend with um, a hip replacement using a walker. Um, regarding also these motorized vehicles, um, there used to be signs saying no motorized vehicles on the trail. And now there's signs, you know, keep below 20. How, how are you measuring this 20 mile an hour? Is there any kind of enforcement? A child could easily lose the grip of their parent and get struck by someone going an easy 30 miles an hour. So I am encouraging you for the, the safety of our, our, our residents, not only um, those who are physically disabled, but for the young and the very old that you maintain a left hand walking trail uh, for Pinellas County trails. And secondly, I encourage on this Earth Day that we nourish the monarch butterfly and plant the um, milkweed butterfly in on our trail to help um, uh, keep this species alive. Um, the uh, butterfly milkweed is the only uh, food source for the larval monarch butterfly. And with this huge expanse of trails, this native Florida plant would be, um, it would be a great blessing, not only to the beauty of our are, are now, but to the beauty of our children in the future. So um, that's what I'm speaking about. And um, the mon the um, butterfly milkweed, it has, um, it's, it's easy to plant. It thrives in the sandy soil. Thank you, here. Diane. Your time has expired. Thank you for speaking with us. And lastly, Madam Chair, um, do you have Curtis Marsh, Marsh on the phone? Mr. Marsh, are you there? Mr. Marsh, are you with us? Hello? Chair, I don't see him on my my list anymore. No? I'm, he may be experiencing tech. No, I'm here. Oh, oh you are. I'm well, unmuted. Welcome. Yeah, sorry. It, it took, no it worries. Took a second to tell me what to do. Thank you. My for name's Curtis Marsh. Go ahead. Curtis Marsh, uh, Masonville Loop, Holiday, Florida. I'm just here to let you know that uh, in the last 30 days, we've taken in two rabbits. That were, I've had to cross county lines into Pinellas County to rescue two rabbits, one just yesterday. Uh, the one yesterday had been running loose for 21 days. The people whose yard it was in uh, had no response from animal control or the SPCA or anyone else in the Pinellas County area. Um, we've also fielded five phone calls uh, with people that have had stray rabbits, but were unwilling, if I wouldn't come get the rabbits, they were unwilling to tell me where they were, so I do not know the actual physical location in Pinellas County. And we've also had four emails with people wanting us to take their rabbits from Pinellas County. Um, this is, again, a monthly occurrence. I hope to strive to increase the curiosity of the rest of the commission so that we might seriously tackle this issue. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you and thank you for your time today. Commissioners, that is the end of our public comment. <coughs> and uh, as you can see, we have spent an hour on public comment today. And now we are on to consent. And is there any pulling of any of the consent items? Questions? Yeah, number 13, please. Please pull item 13. And may I have a motion on the second? It has been moved by Commissioner Peters and seconded by Commissioner Flowers. Although, oh, would you please open we'll that? Voice vote on this one. What? We'll do voice vote on the consent. Madam Chair, voice vote, please. Voice vote so pleases the board. Well, thank you for all the chiming and <laughs> keeping me straight. Thank you. All those in favor, please say yes. Aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? No. And the motion passes unanimously. All right. Um, and now, I'm sorry, hold on one second. Let's move on to item 14, county attorney. 13. I had Commissioner Eggers had 13. Oh, I'm so sorry, Commissioner Eggers. That's okay. That's Please right. forgive me. Uh, just to be quick, um, uh, this is an emergency uh, <coughs> agreement for the um, 3B Cattle LLC for land manager at Crossbar and Albar Ranch. So 
Um, I'm just wanting to make sure that um, in uh, the RFP process, which will be going on in the next few months, um, that that's going to be three separate contracts. So I'm wondering how that's going to be managed if we have three separate contracts. And um, from now until the end of this contract, are we managing it the way it is, or are we going to continue to have, the, or are we going to have three separate contracts to be managed? Because I don't want anything to happen to the people that are in place today between now and the end of the year. So just, just some thoughts, comments on that. Thank you. Good to see you. Hi. Thank you, Commissioner. Go Hi. ahead. Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, Hillary Weber for Utilities. And um, the five-year contract with the forestry company just recently expired. Um, so that is why we're hoping to have this 12-month interim contract in place um, so that we can continue the operations. And uh, we are in parallel working on putting together uh, competitive bid advertisements that will be starting in June for three separate contracts, which will be for the land management, the forestry services, and the ecologists. So they will be separate contracts, and we expect to have an award, recommended award for your approval uh, early next year in 2024. And we're going to manage the, the three contracts ourselves? Yes. So there won't be a general contract? Correct. And from now until the end of this contract, are we going to continue the same way, or are we going to be protecting each of the contracts separately? So with this 12-month interim contract, we will be managing that ourselves. As well. And there will be one more contract similar to this coming to you um, soon for the ecology. It will also be a 12-month interim contract. Okay, so we're, we're taking over that GC role as well in the last year. Um, we're not letting the general contractor that's on the correct. site now manage the other contracts correct okay thank you move approval second well uh, it's been moved by commissioner eggers and seconded by commissioner peters could you please open the voting card that's another voice vote i think what? Voice. thanks hillary by the way all in favor all, the all in favor please say aye. 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 aye 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 any opposed no so the motion approved motion Passes unanimously. Thank you. Just one other thing, uh, sure. Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> Barry, maybe maybe at some point uh, on um, on item 15, we're talking about a couple air handlers, so I didn't want to bring it up for that. But perhaps we could get an, an, another update um, for the new commissioners, but also for some of us, just of what's going on with the Star Center. All of the issues that are not issues. I don't mean that in a negative way, but just the operations we capital can do that for um, we're going to have a pretty extensive one during their budget review if you want okay. to do it there we can because that really outlines all the capital and what's needed okay so. and what's going on there operationally yeah. now okay mm -hmm. thank you that's all i had i'll figure sure. out thank good you. point commissioner thank you all right madam attorney yeah, well, that's no we're item to 18 18 oh, what's going on here regular agenda okay County Administrator. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, item number 18 is a termination of an agreement with Commercial Landscape Professionals um, and DBA uh, Trimac Outdoor. This is for um, cause, a failure to fulfill the terms of the um, agreement. So they're going to push this agreement over to the second lowest bidder uh, for the remaining period while they go through a um, selection process. Okay. Move approval. Second been moved by Commissioner Scott, second by Commissioner Justice. Now can we open the voting card? <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm not opening today, but I'm a yes. I'm a, I'm a yes. Yeah. I'm a yes, and I'm not opening. Oh, yeah, there I am, but it's not on here. All right, well, thank you. All right. Uh, number 17, oh wait, 18, 19, number 19. Item number 19 is an agreement with Inner Circle Sports. This is our uh, contract advisor for uh, the Tampa Bay Rays negotiations. Um, this is split between us and <coughs> the city of St. Petersburg. What would I do without you? Move approval. Second. Then moved by Commissioner Flowers, second by Commissioner Scott. Please open the machine and allow us to It was move. by Commissioner Peters, moved by Commissioner Peters. What did I say? Flowers. Oh, Clerk got it. I, okay. Okay. <laughs> she got it. Good for her. All right. And that passes. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Item 20. This is a state funded grant agreement. Um, this is with the Florida Department of Transportation for ATMS services on route, uh, State Route 580 Skinner um, to Alt 19. Um, you can, the breakdown of the cost sharing is within your packet. Okay. I'll just refresh the that, that, That's Skinner to US 19. A Skinner. Yes. Is that all? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it was moved by Commissioner Peters. I'm not sure who did the second. I think their husband. Second. Did. Second by Commissioner Lapvala. Please open the voting card. Thank you. And that uh, passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, number 20. This is the same thing on um, State Road 5 A's. It calls away from Curlew <coughs> from the Honeymoon Excuse Park me. entrance to US 19. Move approval. Curlew. Second. Moved by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Eggers. Please open the voting machine. Thank you. And that passes unanimously. Number 21. 20, 22, this is an increase in the upset limit with Frontier um, uh, Communications. This is for two, two Ethernet services. This will connect our Clearwater and our St. Pete secondary PSAPs. Move approval. Second. Moved by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Flowers. Please open the voting machine. And that uh, passes unanimously. Number 23. This is the First Amendment with Wright Pierce for professional engineering services for phase two of the Gulf, um, Gulf Beach Water Booster Station Improvement Project. Move approval. Moved by Commissioner Second. Peters. Second by Commissioner Justice. Please open the voting machine. And that passes unanimously. Uh, 24. County attorney reports. Um, I do actually have a brief report I would like to give you all today. Um, as you recall, um, probably a couple meetings ago, you all approved authority for the county attorney's office to file suit against the Florida Pace Funding Agency. As I reported to you back then, that agency had taken action through a bond validation uh, proceeding in Leon County that had absolutely nothing to do with Pinellas County, nor the vast majority of other counties in the state of Florida, um, and managed to get language put into that order giving the impression that they had the authority to operate notwithstanding any approval from Pinellas County in regard to us here. Uh, you all did give us authority to file suit and we have moved forward with that in doing the research to get some of the uh, documents together to proceed forward with that lawsuit. We discovered that the Florida Pace Funding Agency has already filed at least 39 liens against residential properties located in Pinellas County. Either 39? Lien, 39. Either liens or notices of liens. Do um, they have the right to do that? We do not believe so, and that's why we are filing suit. But I did want to give you all the update that they have filed suit. Um, it appears from our research that many, if not all of them, are homesteaded properties. So just to give you that update, they have proceeded forward. Um, <laughs> we have finally managed to get them sued, despite some issues there and we'll be seeking an emergency hearing with the court expeditiously. And Jewel, how are we communicating with those residents? We all? have just discovered this in the official records of the county. Well, don't you think we have an obligation to have some communication with those residents? They must well, be what frantic. We'll be, what we'll be doing is seeking to have the court order that they had no authority to do that in the first place. Right, but make believe that you're the average citizen. What would you, how would you be reacting to that? I assume that these citizens were approached by aggressive salespeople, which is what we've heard in regard to many of the other issues related to PACE from other areas where we've seen that there were problems. Um, and that's something that I think that we're going to need to figure out how to handle. But again, we just found this information and in trying to get things prepared to move forward with the lawsuit, which we have filed. Um, I know that Mr. Kroll informed you that we received a media inquiry about that while I was away. Um, and again, in doing that research, <coughs> we found these liens and again, all residential properties. One more question before I open it up to my commissioners. Is this happening in a particular area of the county or it's all over the county? All, all over the county. And as you recall, we've had this discussion quite a number of times. I know that you all have been approached by some folks that would like to see some changes to our ordinance 
Keep in mind, our ordinance applies to non-residential properties and allows for these this as a funding mechanism only for non-residential properties under your ordinance. Again, these liens have been placed against residential properties. Commissioners, questions, concerns, thoughts, anything? We'll be giving you all updates as to what's going on with the litigation as we are able but to move forward. Is, I have a question. Yeah, but Commissioner Latvala? Is that suit filed in court in Pinellas or in Leon County? In Pinellas County. Commissioner Flowers? Just a question. Would it be inappropriate to share this information with leadership with the Florida Association of Counties? The reason I'm asking that, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I do know that um, there have been, um, I think you and I were at one of the <clears throat> breakout workshops or whatever that PACE representatives were there trying to get counties to allow them to come in beyond the commercial piece of it to Wait. extend into the the residential piece of it and um and i just i'm not saying that we can tell them what to do i just think that they should be made aware so that anyone who may be looking to allow an extension of services um would probably follow this particular instance closely before making decisions. I know that Florida Association of County Attorneys, which again is an arm of, of FAC, is, there is a work group that has been established. Mr. Kroll has been participating on that work group. I know that Ginger is well aware, you know, of the work that's going on with that work group. Um, I know that Don's been in contact with a number of our colleagues and counterparts in other counties. I know that we were going to be sharing the complaint with many of them once, once it was done because there are a number of other counties that, are, that have the same concerns that you all do. Um, we can certainly talk with Ginger and make sure that, that that message is being communicated through to the leadership of FAC. Right. I know that Ginger's aware, and I know that the county attorneys um, have been taking a look at this because it's, it's happening everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, all the counties out there, or nearly all of them, as far as we can tell from some of the communication that's being facilitated by FAC, uh, received the same letter that we did terminating the agreement. Um, it was with the property appraiser and tax collector and others to facilitate the commercial side of it. They were filing liens against these residential properties before they even took that action. Okay. So well, we, can, we can certainly get with Ginger and make sure that it's being communicated through properly. Again, I know that Ginger's aware because, because the Florida Association of County Attorneys has been very much taking a look at this issue. Good. And I, I understand, I think I understand why you did not respond directly to what Commissioner Long asked, because mm -hmm. while you represent the county in our legal issues and concerns, you do not necessarily represent those 39 homes. And so it may not be in our best interest to notify them of that based on what could be said in any future legal proceedings um, as it relates to us attempting to taint the the um, pace as an organization. I guess my question is um, what had been discussed before, not necessarily here, but just throughout the state was that it was not necessarily pace as the organization or the program, but individual contractors that may run afoul of the intent of what pace was set up for. So, um, to the best of your knowledge, is this PACE as the organization that has filed these liens, or is it on behalf of any of the uh, contractors that may be providing services it, and utilizing the PACE program? It's the Florida PACE funding agency, okay. which would be the financier, okay. essentially. That's what now, I needed to. my understanding of, and, and I know that Don can probably fill in some of the gaps, my understanding of the way that many of these programs work is that there are certain contractors either through a contract or some other kind of relationship that have relationships with the different PACE funding agencies. This one just happens to be called the Florida PACE Funding Agency. There are different agencies that do provide funding through this program, so this is just one of them. Um, they're, they're, they're the financiers. They're going to be the ones that are filing the liens. 
Um, one of the things that we're seeking to do, and I'll have Don correct me if I'm wrong, is to declare their actions void here. Mm -hmm. In our opinion, they have no authority to be operating within Pinellas County. And if that's the case, then in theory, many of those liens would be void. That's something that we're going to need to be taking a look at. But again, now that we have gotten them served, um, we are going to be seeking some emergency action with the court to put an end to what they're doing. And then now that we know that they've already been basically operating in violation of Florida law, in our opinion, mm -hmm. uh, certainly in violation of your local ordinance, we'll be addressing that to the best of our abilities in the court here locally in Pinellas County. I have two other questions, but I'll ask you those off. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Flowers. Anyone else? Oh, Commissioner Eggers, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, well, I probably have a different opinion here, but I, I think we need to let the folks who've had liens placed against them know it. We know that there's a problem. My, my understanding will be that there's a financier, there's going to be a contractor that's eventually going to get a contract signed if they haven't already done it, and then they'll be seeking permits. So I'm assuming those are all, most of those projects are permittable projects. So I'm assuming that we, as a county, won't be issuing permits for items that we think is not legal. Um, so that was, that was one question. That's and these residents, unbeknownst to them, or some may know it, may, others not, uh, that, 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 um, that that loan may or may not be uh, okay with their mortgage company because it becomes superior to the mortgage company right. loan. And I just want to make, that's one of the reasons that we haven't approve this this method because there's a lot of unknowns out there and we don't want residents to get themselves and, and I know you know let residents do what they want but this is a very complicated piece of business and I just want to make sure that we're taking they're take, taking care of so I just want to make sure that we're doing the we're not allowing the permitting to happen well, number one in the process because it can happen pretty quick I'm, I'm looking out to Kevin we're gonna have to think through that because how are we gonna know Right. You know, that they're right. we don't have That's the, why the notification I think needs to happen to these residents. Thank you. That's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. The first liens that we found were filed in January. Yeah. So there's a good possibility that work could be complete. Correct. Um, and, and it we're, could we're, be within we're getting a, it a on the back end after the work's done that we're finding this out. It's not on the front end when you'd have a sure. permit process because we don't know a particular homeowner who's the financer of that project, a bank or through this PACE program. We know, we know the 38, 39 liens and who got them, right? Who, but who, that could be work for work completed already. I understand. I'm yeah. saying, the, I'm talking about the notification process. Yeah. I think we can err on the side of notifying, and if they've already got the work done, that's a different issue. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to staff about that. I think it's a great point, Commissioner. I, and, and if we can hold that up and, and not issue permits, that, that would be great. But we'll have to think through that. <coughs> and, and keep in mind, some of the work could be occurring within the municipalities. Correct. within the county so anything that's being done and unincorporated could we not issue a cease and a desist because we, we can, they we, never it shouldn't have occurred in the first place so what we have anyway that's we'll look into all available options um, and certainly one of the things that we would be hoping to have a court declare is that the liens are void all right we have it's a queue going here. Commissioner Justice. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure I'm yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. And you kind of answered my question, but it was their supposition that they didn't need a county ordinance to operate anywhere in Florida after recent action. That's correct? That is their assertion, yes. So I would assume that any large county like Pinellas, if we've got 39, it's happening. So that you kind of touched on that with the, your, your fat conversation, So, but that's where I was going. Commissioner, is that it? Commissioner Latvala. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. This probably is an impossible question, but would we expect there to be more liens that pop up with our residents? There, there certainly could be. There certainly could be, which is, again, one of the reasons why we're going to be seeking emergency action with the court to put an end to at least what's currently occurring. Is that it, Commissioner Lavella, mm -hmm. for the moment? And again, this is only for Pinellas County. This could be happening, mm -hmm. I, again, in many of the counties around the state. So I know that that'll be something that will be getting communicated out through that work group with FACA. Um, but I do agree. It's And again, something we really literally just found out doing mm -hmm. some of the research for this lawsuit. Um, so we'll definitely be making sure that it's communicated properly through FAC 
and uh, I suspect that we'll be getting the attention of many of the other counties and out there with a keen interest. And back to us as well, correct? Pardon me? And back to us as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I do think that we should let the, you know, notify the residents, but if it's going to be an ongoing problem, that may be an almost impossible yeah. thing. Well, you know, I know if there's going to be a couple each week that they're going to have to go in and research to find. And well, I have an idea, but let's let Commissioner Peters make her point before I bring up another one. Oh, I just wanted to commend your staff, Don. I know he does a great job on this subject, and he's the expert on it, and I just think you're doing a great job, so thank you. Excellent. I will so, give a shout out also to Kelly Bakari on our staff who is working Kel, with, working with all Don of, on this issue. All of your staff. Excellent. So, um, Barbara, my question is for you. What is the possibility that we could do a quote-unquote public service announcement just letting our residents in Pinellas County be aware? And I would, I would trust you to work with the attorneys to word that properly so we don't impugn anyone unnecessarily. Good afternoon, Barbara Hernandez, Director of Communications. We're going to be working closely with legal and county administration to follow up on that. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think our best action right now is to seek a remedy from the court. Yes, seek a remedy from the court and yes. see where we can get. That's that's the absolute. And this is why we came to you all and asked to file suit. I'm glad. Especially, I'm particularly glad now uh, that we found out they were operating under the radar. Uh, with no notice to anybody um, and have been doing this for months now so I'm particularly glad that we came to you all and asked to file suit our best remedy right now lies with the court and uh, we will certainly be keeping you all up to date on everything that we are able to to get accomplished well I'm fine with that Jewel but can we ask them to do it post haste we're asking for an up? emergency okay well all right that's good thank you uh, who who else someone else had a point ow, ow, no? ow. <coughs> Okay, one? well, do you have other good news for us, yeah. Madam Attorney? <laughs> that was the only issue I wanted to bring up. County Administrator reports. Um, my only report here is just we went through, you know, kind of public service recognition week, and just a big thank you to our employees. Um, you know, our employees, we some of you see the emails where they're responding to water main breaks, and they're responding, and you know what all they do to prepare for hurricanes, but there's other storm events that come through during the year, our employees, if you ask them why they work here, it's mainly to help people. That's really the reason they come to work, and whether it's an administrative <coughs> job or a field job, they do it for public service. And so it's just a huge shout out to them that they, they're here for the right reason. They try to do things to make life better for our residents. And so just a big thank you to all of our employees for everything that they do um, for this one time a year during Public Service Week. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Barry. All right, and now we are on to our last item um, before we have our public hearing, and that is our County Commission new business, and we will start with Commissioner Latnala. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess it's time for my uh, update on the raise. Um, last time you spoke, they did end up losing one game. <laughs> yeah. Well, Commissioner, um, <laughs> I'd like to point out that we're a month into the season, and they have lost one game in the United States. Um, no offense to my friends in Dunedin, but I don't recognize games played in Canada. Um, so they are still in first place by a hefty margin, best record in the uh, Major League Baseball. Um, and they have the defending World Series champs in town uh, who they beat last night. Um, and so go raise. Uh, Honor flight uh, is today um, at uh, PI, which is a great uh, organization that honors our veterans. Uh, their welcome home um, event, uh, our welcome home party is tonight. The flight is supposed to get back at uh, around 8.15 or 8.30 at PI. Uh, and if you're watching this on some sort of delay, that's April 25th. Um, and I don't know who would be watching this after today. Um, but uh, also, JWB has a kids' first uh, luncheon on Friday. I know some of y'all are going to that. Uh, that's at the Coliseum in St. Pete. Um, recently, I attended the Judge Zerowest and Judge Cope investiture. Uh, congratulations to both of our newly um, elected uh, county judges. 
the Largo PD and the Clearwater uh, Police Department played in their charity softball game uh, last week. Uh, congratulations to Clearwater PD for winning by a decisive margin. Uh, and it benefited uh, Sergeant uh, Dan Loader with the Clearwater PD, uh, who is uh, battling cancer. Um, the the other day, I uh, several of us uh, were also there, and I apologize for mispronouncing this. Uh, Yom uh, Hashoa Reader at the Holocaust Museum for Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, that is also that is always a powerful event. Um, and I uh, met with uh, Wint, Blanton, Wint Blanton recently, and I just wanted to thank him for some assistance on a constituent uh, case. Excellent. Um, but that is my report. You've been very busy. Commissioner Eggers, let's see uh, you top that one. No, I'm not going to try. Um, <laughs> but the, the games, when, at the end of the season, the games will count. Um, just so you know, um, they don't. Those those 14 games will go on the calendar so, on the win loss record somewhere. Um, I'm certainly pulling for those rays, but um, anyway, um, yeah. The, I was going to mention the honor flight, it, and if you're if you're out there and you've got you know kids to take to something, you know, go to a ball game, but go to this too. This is really a neat event to uh, to get a chance to welcome. <coughs> You know, welcoming home sometimes is this the first time they've had a chance to be welcomed home to anything. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, we had the welcome home event for the um, uh, Vietnam veterans um, up in up in Dunedin, and um, it was a very moving event because those veterans were being welcomed home. And uh, it's 50 years later, but it's still deep in their soul that they weren't welcome home at that time. So when you get a chance to honor veterans in any way, I think it's a great thing. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, let's see. Um, thank you for saying something to, about our employees because they are some really amazing employees that run into residents all the time and they talk about, you know, employees are having a problem with this or a problem there. But most of the times when they have all the good encounters, they just kind of like, well, that's what they're supposed to do. And it's true. It is what they're supposed to do. In many, many, many cases, they, they are some creative, hardworking, and they do put the residents first in so many instances. Um, I, I still have my battles and, you know, with staff to say yes to more things and say no, but, uh, but that's okay. That's what it's all about. And um, we, we, ke we keep working hard on that. Um, Let's see. Uh, I'm just I'm going to just say just a couple things about Tampa Bay Water. Uh, we did have a, a pre-budget meeting. Uh, the budget comes for approval next month. Looks like we're having a 0.81 percent increase in the uniform water rate, which is very little, but it's just enough to keep up with some rising expenses. Um, uh, the they had a, a, a about a 10-year capital plan that they introduced as well, which includes the new water source, which I'm calling the 2028 water supply source. It's an expansion of our, um, our, our, our water, our river supply over in, in Hillsborough County that comes this way. Um, and um, and they're, uh, they're starting to work on also that budget includes some monies for uh, water quality improvement work. So there's a lot of capital monies going into that. Um, and. Um, we're having a, there'll be a significant step down in our current bonds in the year 2028, but there'll be an, an, a corresponding increase in the bond costs for some of these other projects. But um, a good capital budget put together, an operating budget that I think is fair and reasonable, and it'll be coming back to us, uh, as I said, next month. Um, a lot of other things, but I won't get into all of that. Um, and I'll leave forward Pinellas to you, Madam Chair. And, um, that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Eggers. And actually, Commissioner Scott is going to be doing the forward Pinellas report today. Okay, great. Awesome. So he's learning. Right, Brian? Yes, ma'am. All right, <laughs> Commissioner Peters. Oh, you know, I, um, I joined the uh, Overdose Fatality Review stakeholder meeting today. Um, and I know Karen gave a great explanation about what that fatality review is, what we're doing, and, you know, what's kind of going on. But the stakeholder meeting was a couple hours long, and it was uh, very interesting to hear the stakeholder input 
um, and the four cases that they gave were so diverse that um, it really facilitated a lot of thought. So uh, I thought it was very successful. I know there will be more um, in the process, but, um, but it was very, very interesting. Uh, I think the stakeholders that participated are very excited because it's the first time that you're really looking at data to really look at true prevention and how you can do prevention, and that really only happens by doing some kind of fatality review like they're doing, um, to really talk to the uh, family members and really learn about the person's history and what kind of trauma might have been experienced, or in one case, no trauma whatsoever. It was just recreational, and they just didn't understand the dangers of recreational, and so it's kind of interesting to uh, kind of hone in on that information and see what could have done especially if there's been previous trauma after trauma after trauma, what could have been done to prevent ever getting to the point that they got to. Um, not just talking the overdose, but the repeated arrests and the repeated other things. I did want to mention they never brought up drug court, and I wanted to uh, email them, but I haven't gotten to it yet. Um, if any of our fatality reviews that they look at ever were in drug court, because we've had a drug court for a really long time, and uh, I don't know that we ever really kind of bring drug court in on our stuff, um, and if it's necessary or not, but I think it's something that is a resource that maybe you want to bring in or not. I don't know. It's up to you. But anyways, um, we've done a lot, been plenty busy, but that's kind of what I thought was worth reporting on. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Peters. Uh, Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. First of all, I'll go with uh, forward Pinellas. Um, all right, uh, four panelists um, met, and we had a informational update on the uh, proposed countywide plan amendments uh, relative to the TEALS uh, update uh, from 2023, which included um, expanded subgroups, uh, four new uh, subcategories uh, that would not be subject to the same restrictions as the original 2008 study. Uh, which would include policy incentives uh, for the four sub subgroups of greater floor area ratio, intensity bonus, and a greater um, use of flexibility. Uh, we also uh, had a vote uh, unanimously uh, that passed to designate Forward Pinellas as the forum to guide the implementation of the Advantage Pinellas uh, Action Plan. We also had an update relative to the uh, draft transportation priorities list. Uh, which included the following, uh, remove the Sunrunner and Pasadena Avenue as completed, uh, added uh, new ni uh, nine newly funded projects, uh, six new priorities, and changes to six existing uh, projects. Um, also on the transportation alter alternatives for bike and pedestrian projects, uh, three newly, newly funded projects were added and five new uh, priorities. Uh, we also... Um, reviewed a draft uh, memorandum of understanding for a regional MPO provided by uh, Whit Blanton um, with the uh, proposed timeline of July 1st, 2027 for a merged MPO of the three counties. Um, Director Whit Blanton gave us his uh, report, which also included um, waterborne transportation, uh, potential service development grant submitted by PSTA for a three-year uh, trial period. And then two other action items. Um, the first one was to um, a motion to approve uh, Whit Blanton to send a letter to our legislative delegation to request that the I-275 improvement project from the Howard Franklin Bridge to 38th Avenue be included in the final state budget. And then lastly, authorize uh, Whit Blanton um, to send a letter to our delegation relating to utilizing automated technology to enforce speed limits in school bus zones. And then we received an update on the Drew Street uh, project. And uh, that concludes the forward uh, Pinellas report. Uh, Commissioner Scott, Commissioner uh, just, Peters just, has a question. Just for yes. clarification, did you say they're removing the sun run around Pasadena Avenue, that one designated lane? No, 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 no. That was the on the list of projects. That was removed from the list of projects because the project okay. was completed. Okay. Thank you okay. for clarification. Um, so, in addition uh, to that, um, I also attended uh, the noise mitigation um, uh, meeting. I don't think this means was it every other month, Barry, or quarterly. The noise. Anyways, at uh, at PIE at PI, I attended that meeting just to kind of get a flavor of what what takes place there. I attended the Shore uh, Drive uh, Bridge Replacement Community Input uh, Meeting in Palm Harbor. That went very well. 
Um, last night I attended the St. Pete Innovation Panel discussion down at the Birchwood, which was extremely interesting. Uh, Kathy Wood spoke for about 15 or 20 minutes, and um, she's absolutely brilliant. Um, and then it was interesting because there was about, it was almost like Shark Tank. It was like 10 companies that went up and had 90 seconds to present their, you know, their company idea. And then there were four ben venture capitalists that just, just zinged questions at them. So it was really in interesting to see some of the new ideas out there. And your comment on our last recent workshop of, you know, be ready to be disrupted. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of really interesting uh, things The wait, there. there's more to come. Oh, there's way, way, way more to come. Uh, also, last Wednesday, uh, the Historic Preservation Board met, which I am uh, the chair of. Um, it did conflict with PSTA committee meetings that day, so I was un unable to attend uh, the PSTA committee meetings. However, um, the Historic Preservation Board approved the permit for the commencement of a project at uh, 1026 Florida Avenue in Palm Harbor, uh, which is planned to be a, a restaurant and a high-end steakhouse. So that's something that we can all look forward to. And then uh, lastly, uh, last, on Thursday of last week, I was the keynote speaker at the Turnaround Breakfast Awards, which recognized 46 Pinellas County middle and high school students uh, who have faced uh, difficulties and challenges in their lives that many others had, have not had uh, to face and still managed to turn around their academic performance and uh, give them a much uh, brighter future. So it was very, uh, very uh, neat experience to, uh, to be there at that and, and see all of those smiling faces and, and, and these great students doing so many good things. It must have been very rewarding. It was. It was. So that concludes my report. Okay. So I have a question for you on the noise abatement meeting that you attended. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't able to go, but I did have Tony there, and I wanted to know from your perspective if you, what did you come away with that? Um, any solutions or thoughts or recommendations, um, ideas? There, there's a lot of what I call regurgitation of this is what occurred since the last time that we met. Um, that was kind of the primary substance of the meeting. We did have, we did have um, a few public speakers at the end, one of which uh, either is or was a former air traffic controller, who I thought had some very interesting thoughts and ideas of, of what the Coast Guard could do in terms of, and, I, and I'll get into the weeds really, really quick on this, because there are a lot of things that um, I didn't really understand. but. Um, he was talking about, you know, altitudes and, and where they could throttle up and how they could throttle up and things that they could do from a flight management perspective, um, you know, to help mitigate noise. Whether any of that stuff is operationally or logistically possible, I, I really don't know. But anyways, I, I thought that that gentleman would probably be a good person to have on that board because he really seemed to be extremely knowledgeable in that, in that area. Um, that was really it. On, quite honestly, I, I don't, I mean, Barry and I have talked about it a little bit. Um, you know, I even suggested what it, you know, the, the airport staff will send letters to whether it's the Navy or whether it's the Coast Guard or whether it's Allegiant Airlines or whoever. Um, or McDill. Or right, or McDill requesting that they do certain things or, or, or not to do certain things. I don't know if it would lend any weight to it or not if, if a letter also came from the Board of County Commissioners. Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. I mean, at the end of the day, I think they kind of do what they want to do because it is a voluntary, you know, we're working under the FAA rules and there's not really a lot of dials that we have access to that we can turn or levers that we can pull to really affect much. So to all of that, uh, I just would like to add, I think you all know that I have a son who's a pilot. And I happen to know that in our Tampa Bay region, we have seven different air spaces that jets fly through coming into the region. And one of the things that I've learned just from listening to him is that taking off is optional, but landing is not. And with all of the cancellation and delays going on mm -hmm. around the country for a variety of reasons, we've all heard them, when the flight is delayed and takes off later than it has been anticipated, it has to land. Right. Do you know what I mean? And so they do their very best, and they do change flight patterns. But at the end of the day, our 
our traffic going in and out of all of our airports. I mean, if you want to hear a mind-blowing presentation, yeah. wait till you hear the one from Joe Lapano at TIA right. and what they're going through with all of their additional traffic that's coming in and how they're trying to prepare for it, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it is part of what we have to learn to live with somewhat. I know I hear more than Allegiant, I hear a lot of the military planes right. going yeah. over, and they are really loud. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, it's, you know, I live on the on the intercoastal, so I <clears throat> constantly have uh, Coast Guard, yep, you I know, bet. the C-130s and the, uh, and, and the you know, twin engine helicopters constantly have them, have them going over. You know, and another thing, you know, a few months ago, um, you know, what, had some family that was flying into town on Allegiant, and because of weather, they were flying in from Asheville, but the plane was coming from Savannah. It was several hours delayed because of because of weather. But but there you've got people that are stranded trying to either get here or perhaps get home, and 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 they have a right to get home. Yeah. So I mean, you can't just tell people, well, sorry, you 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 didn't pick off by 10 p.m., so you're you got to spend the night in. Charlotte or, or yeah. wherever that may be. It's a big problem, and, you know, there's no easy solutions, that's for sure. Yeah, follow -up comment. Oh, Commissioner Peters has a follow-up. So, uh, you know, all the meetings that I attended on that issue, I think they're, I think they're quarterly. Um, just so nobody thinks that Allegiant isn't engaged, or at least when I was attending, they always had someone fly in for that meeting. I mean, Allegiant has been very committed to make sure that they address this, and they sent in a high-ranking person in their organization to attend the noise abatement meeting in Pinellas County mm -hmm. because it's really important to them. So I don't anyone want to think that Allegiant isn't taking this seriously. I think they do, yeah. and they are represented. And so just so anyone that's listening doesn't think that, they, they are represented. Yeah. Good, good want, to know. Um, Commissioner um, Edgar. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's a good point. Also, our staff... Um, Tom Jewsberry and staff there are very committed to reaching out. They have a very close relationship with Allegiant. Um, we have offered uh, our staff the the possibility of sending a letter um, to to them, uh, Allegiant specifically, um, about you know minding their p's and q's as they come in and leave. Um, and so it's really one of those things where you don't want to do it very often. Right, yeah. um, and we're kind of stand ready to do that when they and when staff feels it would be important to do, um, but it doesn't take away from the fact that I know a lot of our residents, you know, mm -hmm. suffer that from that from the, the noise from the airport. That's unfortunately the nature of the beast. Um, but to the extent that uh, I know they're working closely with us to make sure that they minimize those mm -hmm. negative encounters as much as possible. Um, I am sure people living there are looking and saying. What are you talking about? Some nights they're coming in four or five after midnight, and you know they're allowed to. We can't do anything about it, and they're trying not to do it. So, and it's a, it's a tough it's a tough one sometimes to to put your you know arms around. But thank you, Commissioner Eggers. Commissioner Peters. Flowers. I mean, Commissioner Flowers. I'm looking <laughs> I'm looking at you, and I'm. It's okay. I can wait. I um, know no, it's busy. Um, busy weekend. First, want to say. Um, Thank you so much, um, as always, to Pinellas Technical College. They had their signing day, which is um, all of the students that attend Pinellas County High Schools that have uh, participated in some form of technical trade program and have decided to attend Pinellas Technical College, either St. Petersburg or Clearwater Campus, after graduation. They had 110 students at the St. Petersburg location and about what the that's them calling me now. And about 80, <laughs> about 80 participants at the Clearwater campus. A huge shout out to uh, Darlena Herring for attending that for me because I was out of town at the um, ICG training. And congratulations to Chris Blackwell. Um, congratulations to uh, Kaisha Robinson, who is the manager for Office Workforce um, Innovations. Um, I attended the open house and ribbon cutting of iHeartMedia. They moved over here from Tampa. They um, have about eight radio stations under their purview, and they're located out in the um, Feather Sound area. So it, 
Their headquarters is absolutely wonderful, top-notch, all of the new technology that they have there. So if you get a chance, give them a call or swing by and ask for a tour. It's really, really nice. Um, and they've hired a lot of people um, from within the community that actually work at that radio station. So congratulations to them. Um, thank you so much to Barry and to Lourdes. I reached out to them because I received a call from the Executive Director of Pinellas Opportunity Council. Some of you know that POC and the Pinellas County Urban League and others receive dollars from DEO to provide financial support to persons to help pay their utility bills, whether it's electric or water. Um, particularly, POC uh, supports seniors. And they had been advised that um, they had run out of money. <laughs> they didn't have any funds left. And POC specifically had about $400,000 in outstanding invoices for services provided. But I did receive an update um, uh, from Patty Sawyer, who is the executive director for POC, stating that um, they thought they had been able to work something out. Um, they, meaning DEO, had been able to work something out and that they um, would be able to uh, receive some additional funding in order to pay those organizations um, and then provide some additional dollars going forward until um, um, they were able to garner additional funds from the feds because their money comes from the federal government that comes to the state and then goes to those organizations. So I just want to thank um, Lourdes and um, Barry for assisting me uh, and just getting information and finding other resources that people could apply to who were in line to have their utilities paid but was held up because of the lack of funding. Um, I attended the First Ladies event. I was honored as a First Lady in 2016, um, but the individuals who were honored as First Ladies, they did two classes, 2022 and 2023, because COVID um, kept us from doing a larger uh, event like we normally do. So the persons honored for 2023 was Shermaine Andrews, Dr. Sharon Rogers, Karen Davis Pritchett, who runs the diversity program for Empath Health, and um, Valerie Powell Stafford, who is the president and CEO for Northside um, Hospital. For 2022, it was Dr. Sandra Brown, who is the president and CEO of Gulf Coast Jewish Family and Community Services. Dr. Cynthia Johnson, our very own, was acknowledged. Bemetra Simmons, many of you already know her. Erica Sutherland, who has just really come um, into her own. She has produced a number of plays that have actually made television. She's currently uh, in charge of several plays in Demon's Landing that you can attend if you want and sit out on a blanket. Um, and she works uh, very closely with American Stage. And then Donna Welch, the wife of Mayor Ken Welch. So um, if you see them, please congratulate them on that. I attended the um, a telephone call for the NACO Housing Task Force. And um, during that conversation, it was really a discussion about some of the language we're trying to get changed with the Department of Housing and Urban Development to look at enhancing the dollar value of the HUD Section 8 vouchers, since we are finding that the vouchers are not even aligned with what's being asked for rent locally, and many people are unable to utilize their vouchers um, because um, the dollar value just doesn't match with what's being asked for rent. We also talked about uh, codes and fees, and um, so I was always as always, I was excited to talk about some of the very unique um, things that we're doing here in Pinellas County that um, allows uh, a, a greater latitude of work relationships with our contractors and developers. Um, that is it. Oh, I, I graduated, you guys. I know you probably you don't did? care. You did? Not, not with my doctorate, from oh. ICG. <laughs> wow. Uh, I graduated okay, well, that's from ICG. Good too, but I However, today, this afternoon, I did get my letter. My doctorate um, submittal to the IRB board was uh, accepted with a condition. There were only two little small things they wanted me to change. I'm going to change them when we break for dinner. 
and uh, get it back to them so then I can move to the last phase of it. And hopefully you all will come to my graduation. <laughs> I'm throwing a big party. But um, no, I was talking about from the ICG. I want to thank you all for allowing me to attend our workshop virtually because um, the class started at 12 in Gainesville. And of course, our workshop started at 930. So I want to thank my colleagues for allowing me to attend virtually um, the workshop. But um, I'm excited, and there'll be a real graduation in June. So hopefully, at the, you all at will, the annual conference, right? Mm -hmm. So well, hopefully, you all will come to the annual conference. So for the benefit of our new commissioners, I graduated from that program as well. Oh, okay. And I would like to know from you if you found it interesting and informative. Interesting and very informative, and you would have certainly liked the last day on Friday because we had panels. And the panel you would have loved was on emergency management that incorporates resiliency and sustainability. Excellent. So you would have certainly loved that from the uh, University of Florida's IFAS program. So I encourage our newest members, if you haven't thought about it, so when you go hopefully to the annual conference this year, that you'll explore it a little bit and maybe thinking about doing that too because I do believe it makes you a more thoughtful and Brought, you know, it, it certainly helps you understand the depth of responsibility that comes with being a county commissioner. And I just found it enormously valuable. So hopefully you'll think it is too. All right, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, since last we met, uh, had the chance to tour uh, the West Klosterman Preserve. It was my first chance to get out there in person. I uh, appreciate Mr. Carter and his time sharing that with me. Uh, I represented the commission at the mayor's council meeting this past month. I uh, joined others in doing a reading at the Yom HaShoah uh, ceremony at the Florida Holocaust Museum. Uh, incredible experience. If you haven't done that before, I encourage you to do it next year. Um, it was great to join Commissioner Scott and Chair Long and Chief Judge Rondolino at the ribbon cutting at the innovation, uh, renovations and expansion of our Justice Center on 49th Street. The place looks amazing. Creative Contracting did some really good work. Uh, I wanted to congratulate Feast, who uh, last weekend had their cereal domino train. Uh, in one day, they collected 3,200 boxes of cereal for their summer program, so nice. they're doing good work for the folks. Um, and then we were talking about Public Service Week and our employees, and I didn't mention this at our last meeting, but uh, we got a call from a constituent a while back, I guess between the last couple meetings, and he had a relative who had kind of fallen through the cracks of public service and health care and and um, so, I, of course, I called Lourdes. That was my first call. And she and Karen uh, jumped on it, connected this person with the appropriate services, got her in. And we say we do stuff a lot for uh, life-changing work. This was life-saving work. Uh, this woman got in and got connected to the right services, had emergency surgery that literally saved her life. Oh. And I just wanted to call out Lourdes and her entire team over there. Uh, they do that kind of work all the time. And I'm incredibly grateful for their responsiveness. That's really a great story. Yes. Thank you, Lourdes, and your team. Please extend our deepest appreciation to all of them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, I can't beat that, Charlie. That's just <laughs> incredible. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll try to be brief, but there's been a lot going on, as you all have attested to in your reports. I was especially interested to share with you our uh, conversations at our BTS board which directly affects us in the budget process so think about this going forward their employee satisfaction is around 90 percent in the BTS department and retention is very high they only have a 10 percent vacancy rate which is way below most of the other departments within our county they also talked about how regional cooperation can lower costs through scaling. He called it scaling. Having three counties requesting a service increases its buying power and lowers the cost. For instance, on the LIDAR mapping, by having three counties request mapping for the region instead of just Pinellas, we saved an incredible amount of money and got the same detailed mapping that we would have gotten if the county had done it alone. So I thought that was a significant thing. An idea came about with, during the meeting for a stronger, well-written letter to go to Tyler, which I then followed up with Barry to see if he knew about Tyler. They are not very good partners, I must say. 
in the past asking for a time frame on vendor issues with implementation of our new jury system and complying with Supreme Court mandates that all court reports must be received by December 24th of 2023. And right now, only one of our civil court silos will be in compliance due to the lack of attention by this Tyler company. And to me, that is totally irresponsible you know, that we don't have the ability to hold their feet to the fire, especially when you're thinking about the fact that we're spending public dollars to contract with them. And so Barry and I had an in-depth conversation about that, and I don't know if you want to weigh in on another <coughs> thought about it, Barry, but well, you have irritates me <laughs> to no end. You, you do have, we have compliance issues with, it's like with any contract. The problem is starting over. You know, and you're into an implementation and you don't get the performance that you have, you know, it becomes very difficult. You could need to rebid, you need to, you know, start over, and you got a deadline to perform with. Um, I'm unfamiliar with that particular one. Tyler is a very, very large company and they have many different fingers. Courts are one piece of their overall business. But they do have government relations teams. I think, you know, follow up, use purchasing, put the pressure on them. You can escalate that to make sure you get the highest level people. And they'll be responsive to that. I think um, we should. I, I had that in a different uh, section of Tyler and a different place that I worked. And uh, we were able to get response. But it does take time and it delays and it's frustrating. Yes. And the fact that they are one of very few companies that do that kind of work makes it even more of a, they're holding us hostage, in my opinion. Okay. Okay, on to my uh, last report, maybe, <laughs> on the London trip in, it, as it relates to Virgin, I, uh, Virgin Air. If you get an opportunity to take that flight, take it, because it's just an incredible new aircraft. And one of the things that we were exposed to is the woman who heads up J.P. Morgan Chase. She was an amazing, amazing young woman. And I do recall talking to you in the workshop about blockchain and AI and how it's changing everything. And I was ever so pleased to hear that our very own BTS department is very well aware of the impact that those two things are having on their business. And I do think it would be important at some point, Barry, I'm not exactly sure where it fits in, that we have a quote unquote, and I, I hate to call it an expert, because is, is there an expert on anything anymore? Everything's changing so quickly. To maybe give us a little more information than we currently have individually on blockchain and technologies and uh, our AI, which is artificial intelligence and how that works and what it means for the way we conduct our business going forward. In some ways, it's a little frightening, at least to me, I found. So, you know, knowledge is power and I think it's important that we at least be aware. That's just my thought on that. Um, it's, and when you talk about those things, it's especially important is on the issues of payment and purchasing and how you issue invoices and how you get your money in a matter of seconds, where it used to take sometimes months to get paid for something. Now it can happen in a, in a matter of seconds with these new technologies. And that's how her comment about, thank you for remembering, Commissioner Scott, I'm really impressed about how it's so important for all of us to be disruptive because if you don't learn to be disruptive and get comfortable with it, your whole little area of influence is just going to crumble in the new world that we're moving through. Um, then on the Tourist Development Council, there's quite a few things going on there. There is a conference in May that I will be attending, and I think we've already asked if you can take care of that meeting for me as the vice chair. 
And Create, Creative Pinellas had a great presentation about their events going on in May 4th and 5th for local emerging artists that was very interesting. The Let's Shine campaign is moving into other areas besides TV. It's going on to gas station screens, EV charging stations, and looking to bring back rideshare vehicles that have full vehicle wraps with the St. Pete Clearwater brand to talk, start conversations with riders. And it just made me so proud when we were traveling around London to see several of those several vehicles on the streets of London with Visit St. Pete Clearwater wraps around them. It was like a breath of fresh air from home to see that. So uh, they are having an effect there. VPK and Miles partnership that we have with our folks in London had a presentation using data more than ever to make advertising dollars go further with very specific targeted advertising. And speaking of advertising, because I know I heard, I believe, a comment from Commissioner Latvala at one of our meetings about our advertising dollars. And one of the points that was made in London was advertising will be more important than ever because now that COVID is over with, much of many of the other countries around the globe are competing with the United States and our numbers are starting to reflect that with that demand here in Pinellas County is slumping from the hoteliers. So keeping your eye on those numbers as they come out month to month will be important for us going forward. The Sunscreen, Sunscreen Film Festival at AMC Sundial in St. Pete is April 27th to the 30th, where they will be presenting 150 films with networks and filmmaker, with a network and filmmaker tour. The National Tourism Week is scheduled for May 7th through the 13th with a kickoff with the Rays event at the stadium. Uh, our next meeting is on May 17th, which will be a budget meeting for the TDC. St. Pete Clearwater was indu inducted into the American Marketing Association Hall of Fame this year. And of course, everyone's very, very proud of that. We do have a lot of requests for the TDT TDC money coming in June. Uh, and the possible requests include the Dali, the Rays, the Carter G. Woodson Museum, Beach Renourishment, the possible County Youth Sports Complex at Toy Town, and the City of Clearwater Sports Complex upgrades as well. So stay tuned on all of that. Now, tomorrow, just so you're all aware, uh, around 2.30, I will be making a phone call follow-up to the White House to talk to the folks that we talked with when we were up there. The purpose of that call is to uh, get them to move off the dime with the Army Corps of Engineers and their refusal to accept our waiver, which by the way, the Jacksonville office is the one that recommended it. So we're taking it up a notch with the phone call and if that doesn't work, I've already spoken to them this morning and told them I'll start preparing for our next trip to D.C. where we will be meeting with the president because I told them when I was up there that if they weren't able to take care of this issue, it's placing Pinellas County beaches and our citizens in harm's way, especially when you think that June 1st is the beginning of hurricane season. I mean, this is not a joke. It's getting to be a really, really huge issue. And lastly, from my report, is that we have another bridge lighting request for June 19th, and it's to support sickle cell awareness. Move approval. Second. Those Brown Manatee have already made it. Thank you so much. You're all just so wonderful. Now, two we more. To vote on that. Oh, okay. All in favor. It's been moved. All in favor. In nah. Thank you, Madam Chair. All in favor. Aye. Please say aye. 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 aye, aye, and aye. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Um, just because you brought it up and not everyone watches our work sessions, even though I wish they would, um, when we talked about the bed tax and I mentioned the advertising, I mentioned it because 
with the 60, even with the 60-40 split, 60% 60 going to advertising, 40% going to uh, capital projects. Uh, within the next year or two, we're going to have hundreds of millions of dollars spent just on advertising. I've never proposed that we quit advertising. I just wanted to bring it up uh, for the benefit of the board that maybe we don't spend as much money on advertising. No, and that's why I brought it up, Commissioner, because we did have, when I first came on the County Commission, and that was some time ago, so I do believe it's time for another conversation potentially. We had a joint meeting with our partners at the TDC, and we talked in depth, Charlie, you may remember that, about that 60-40 split. It was a very, um, shall I say, spirited conversation, and so perhaps it's time to have that again, if you so desire, is all I'm saying. Okay, so again, um, shoot. I do want to wish a, a happy birthday, Commissioner Flowers, since you were singing happy birthday at the beginning today, for our uh, own intergovernment relations person, Brian Lowack. Today is his Aww. birthday, and I don't want it to be a surprise because I told him this morning, be ready to hear me say that again. Happy birthday, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you all going to join me in wishing him a happy, happy birthday, birthday, Brian? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Now, uh, last thing. <clears throat> you know, I think all of you know a lot about my family and that I am not only a wife, but a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother. And along the way, here's what I have learned. Whenever there is an issue that's percolating, it's really best if we just address it heads on. And so to that point, I have asked Commissioner, I mean, Barry Burton, our county administrator, if he would work with all of you for us to have a meeting similar to what we did, Commissioner Peters, after you came on the commission. Oh, you right. might remember it. In, in the conference room with just the county commissioners to begin with, so that we can have a chit chat about the protocols on the fifth floor. I think it's important for us moving forward. We have, we, we, we are all grown ups here, and we have a lot of very serious issues to address. And one of the reasons why we've been so, in my mind, successful over the years is because every one of us individually have worked really, really hard to treat each other with respect and with kindness and with trust. And it hurts me personally to feel, see, hear that maybe a little bit of that is beginning to slip, and I would like to nip it in the bud with your indulgence, if you would so be amenable to that. So somebody nod your head or say sure. something. When? So that, when? Well, I don't know. I'm left that up to Barry Burton and his thanks. staff. To, thanks. What? <laughs> he said thanks. Well, no, I mean, I'll have, I'll have to only, find a date. <laughs> he's the only one, and I would like to do it with your permission sooner rather than later. And uh, thus far in this year, myself and Commissioner Peters have worked really well together, mm -hmm. have we not? And I do not want to see that not continue through the end of the year and into next and so we do agree that this would be a good thing mm -hmm. do we not yes okay so yeah. but but not in the conference room if that's okay yes thank well, you no whatever, wherever it might be no. good for you yeah, no, thank I, you i got you commissioner thank you. <laughs> yeah. i'm trusting him to look out for the best interests of all of us you know emotionally mentally and physically so that would be good okay well thank you so much do we have to do the resolution for the joint meeting Yes, please. Oh, shoot. Did I forget? I'm so sorry. I'm so glad you're helping me stay straight. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, ma'am. Let's let's address the joint resolution. The resolution for the joint meeting. Move approval to so the got, resolution do we need to of open? the joint meeting between the Board of County Commissioners Pinellas, Hillsborough, and Pasco to be held on okay. May 17th. At no, the no, no, International no. Airport in Tampa. 12th. You are so May 12th. Good. On May 12th. May the 12th. Like I said, May 12th. I stand correct. 
<laughs> 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. TPA. Don't be late. Did you know? Hopefully it goes better than the three. And, and commissioners, one, yeah. one slight modification to that. We have some conflicts uh, regarding we were going to just do, you know, have some uh, soft hors d'oeuvres or something afterwards. We really need to do that before people have lunch appointments and things. So so we'll have coffee and danishes starting at 9. People can mingle, and we'll get on with our business at 10. Perfect. And I have to say that was one of the best things about being in London with my colleagues from Hillsborough and Pasco County. And we all worked overtime to really, you know, be, be uh, have a really good time together. And that, that was wonderful. We need to get a vote. We need to get a vote on the resolution. Oh, do we need to open the vote card? Please open All in one favor. favor. Aye. All in Aye. favor. Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, everyone. That that passes unanimously and I trust with that Barry you'll be able to provide us with an agenda here shortly um, I will we uh, we actually met yesterday or uh, finalizing the agenda and then I'll be um, walking that around with you um, and getting any final input before we finalize that in post perfect perfect okay with, well is there anything else that we need to address Commissioner Eggers? I'm done I'm finished Okay, I have actually <laughs> things here, but I'm not going to do it. You what? I have some things here, but I'm not going to do it today. How's that? Oh, please don't do it at the end of our work, our meeting tonight. Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm finished. Thank you. Okay, anybody over here? Anything else? No? Okay, then, with that said, we are adjourned.
So, um, Madam Chair, yes. um, I would like to indulge the board for a few minutes at the end, if I could, please. Uh, okay, Commissioner, I'm going to I'm going to defer that to the chairman, if you don't mind. She'll be back here in a few minutes. Okay. Um, so, Barry, you want to work on 27, please? Madam Clerk. Thank you. Um, agenda item number 27 is a petition by Richard E. Childress II and Tawanya M. Childress, Childress to vacate five foot portion of a 10 foot drainage and utility easement lying along the southerly boundary of Lot 1 Bayou Estates Tract 5, lying in section 193016, Pinellas County, Florida. Since this is a quasi judicial hearing, all those individuals who plan to speak on this item must be sworn in. For those wishing to speak, whether you are attending in person or virtually, if able, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Signify by saying, I do. Letters of no objection have been received by the clerk for the, from the appropriate parties. All interested parties have been notified as to the date of the public hearing, and no correspondence has been received by the clerk. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Commissioner, staff has no objection to this. Commissioners, what Move are approval. Your second. It's been moved by Commissioner Eggers and seconded by Commissioner um, Flowers. Yes. Uh, would you open the voting card, please, and allow us to vote? I'm a yes. Oh, I'm a yes. I might not have joined again. And that passes unanimously. All right. Next. Number 23, Barry. 28. 28. I apologize. No. I don't have my cheaters. <laughs> Agenda item number 28 is a proposed resolution approving the expansion of the boundaries of the existing city of Largo, Clearwater Largo Road Community Redevelopment Area and making a finding of necessity that blighted conditions exist within the proposed expansion area. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received by the clerk and the matter is properly before the authority to be heard. Commissioners? Barry? We do have um, staff is available to answer any questions, and we have staff presentation if you if you desire. And also, we have representatives from the city of Largo, including the mayor and city manager here, to probably speak and answer any questions. All right. Come, please come any forward. Right. Need to go to my presentation, please. has not come up. It is on the screen behind you. Oh, okay. I just can't see it on the screen. Um, <clears throat> I got a piece of paper. I'll walk you through it. Now the real question is, I can't advance it. All right, folks on our back. Uh, <laughs> Lou, any idea? Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Commissioners can't see it on the screen either. They can see back here. We have it on our iPad, yeah. so. Yeah. Okay. You can pull it off. Okay. Go ahead. All right. We'll give it a shot here. Uh, good evening. Evan Johnson, Planning Division Manager of Pinellas County. Uh, I'm going to walk you through the Clearwater Largo Road. There we go. Thank you so much. CRA uh, expansion and finding necessity. Um, and I'm going to start with a brief uh, summary of our uh, recent it says recent 2021 uh, CRA policy. And the reason I do that, obviously, we don't see these items very often. But back in 2021, we did adopt a policy uh, to help us um, address how to look at different CRAs uh, when they're coming in for whether they're new or whether they're an extension, expansion, et cetera. So this kind of gave us a framework to do that. Um, this essentially is uh, the idea is when a new CRA comes in, we do a scoring uh, process with that CRA. Then we are able to, based on what the score is, and that's usually looking at socioeconomics, uh, conditions, et cetera, we're able to make recommendations based on our policy, whether or not we think we should contribute at the full 95% level of tax increment or below that. So this kind of creates the framework for us <laughs> to move forward. And the city of Largo is actually the first, uh, it's them and the city of Clearwater who are the first two that are using this policy throughout their process. Um, so we've been kind of working that in throughout and we'll continue to do so. And it does not appear that I can switch, so maybe next slide. There we go. 
So the finding of necessity process, um, the city did complete a finding of necessity study. This is state statutory requirement for a new CRA. Um, there has been an existing Clearwater Largo Road CRA for quite some time now, um, but it has never received a uh, tax increment from us or the city. So we've never, a uh, trust fund has never been created. So while they have done a lot of work and they've made a lot of investment within that area, it has not been done with like county tax increment dollars right. or city tax increment specifically. Um, so when they, they've been talking about the idea of not only looking to do a uh, tax increment trust fund, but also to expand that area to kind of capture some of the other areas that have been struggling around uh, that original CRA. They completed a study that is required by statutes um, and in addition to that, we asked them to produce data and analysis related to the existing CRA um, to show that it still meets those criteria, even though uh, technically they didn't have to do that because we have already had a finding necessity for that older area. So they completed that analysis as well, and that was in your uh, agenda packet. Um, our recommendation is, uh, as I mentioned there at the bottom, uh, our recommendation is to go ahead and uh, expand that and delegate authority, which is why we're here tonight. The total acreage, as you can see, of the existing CRA is 300 acres, uh, 307, 366 in the expansion. Um, this is the North Greenwood area is one of our uh, economic impacts of poverty target areas. Um, that is the area that basically goes from North Greenwood and Clearwater all the way down uh, to Largo and South uh, into Pinellas Park. Um, the fiscal impact. Now, this is the first part of a process. Uh, if tonight you all vote to delegate authority, redevelopment authority for them, the city would then go and begin their planning process. We do not actually make a determination as to uh, a TIF contribution, the amount of money, et cetera, until they come back with that adopted plan and you all have adopted it. Um, so there's a lot of process still left. However, uh, we did look at um, basic projections um, for what we might be talking about in the near term. So looks like fiscal 25 we would be starting with the actual TIF contributions <coughs> if we assume that the first couple of years are always going to be within that under 200,000 we've estimated it here county contribution to be about 65,000 right now of course that escalates over time um, depending on the performance of property values in the area so when was the CRA originally established I believe it is 1995, but I have so many Largo experts in this room to confirm. So, uh, so, so that CRA would be 1996. Oh, I was close. Okay, so yes, it's it's 30 year life is almost. So, dang. so, so, the our interpretation of the statute is because the trust fund has never been established. Uh, we that's really what the 30 year and the time frames are attached to in the statutes. So it's not attached to the creation of an agency or the plan, it's attached to the funding mechanism. And since we've never approved the funding mechanism, we're really approaching this as a new CRA. So they would get, they would fall completely within our policy. They would be eligible for what is allowed in statutes now. And you use is, the base year now. Yes, which is 40 years uh, is the maximum you can do now um, if you create a trust fund now. So they would have be eligible for up to 40 but they would follow our policy, which does not allow for more than 20 at an initial approval. So if they come back with their plan, we could approve them up to 20. Um, so the, the resolution that you all have, uh, what it accomplishes tonight is it revises the boundaries, um, taking the old CRA and expanding them, uh, and it excludes all unincorporated areas within. If you've looked at the maps, there are some unincorporated pockets within there. Those are excluded from the CRA. <coughs> Ultimately, if the, as those do, uh, as those are uh, brought into the city, annexed in, they have the option of coming back, but they will have to come back to you all to add uh, those areas into the CRA in the future. Um, and your res yes, ma'am. I had a question. Mm -hmm. So can they add those in at the time of annexation? So when they annex them, can they put it in that, uh, ordinance at whatever we're going to the annexation ordinance can they uh, at the time <clears throat> put that caveat in at that time so it's done at one time or does it so have to be a separate it has been our opinion um, <clears throat> due to process reasons that uh, we our preference would be that separate. they need to come back and they need to bring a group at a time okay. because otherwise you could have different parcels with different base years <laughs> okay. and 
you know, that would be a challenge for the property appraiser and others if you were trying to do that on a parcel by parcel basis. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. and, and just one question on the, yes, um, the, the uh, estimated dollars, mm -hmm. the fiscal Sorry. impact of 62000 starting in fiscal year. That's for the entire? That is for the entire area, and that would be the county's contribution right, I understand. starting that year. Yes, what sir. What would it be if it's just a, left alone? Like if we didn't expand it and they asked for a TIF for their existing area, what would that be? I do not have that answer. Okay. I don't know. I would assume it would be, I mean, ultimately, That's it's, because it's all tied to growth and the base year is the same and the areas are basically the same, we would just be assuming a 3%, 4% growth rate over it. So, you know, you could probably estimate it's close to half. I mean, because you're about 307 acres in the existing, 377 in the new. Growth is growth, and since the base is the same. Well, yeah, but that one area has been worked on for a while, right? The expansion area is not. That's what they're concerned about. Correct, correct. But that, and, and it all depends on how many new developments are already kind of online, coming okay. in line on, on that older area. Certainly something we could look into, but we did not calculate that. Um, next slide, please. Oh, we'll go one back when you have a chance. So our process moving forward is we are on item number two, bullet number two. This is the delegation of authority. The city will go back and begin their planning process. Um, I believe they'll be doing an RFP for a consultant. Um, when they bring that back, they'll go through their approval. They'll go through ours. Um, it, is a, it is a long process. We have to do staff review. There's a lot the policy asks for from a scoring perspective now so that we can bring you uh, recommendations. Um, but we think that ultimately um, give us, say, a year and a half of planning and then bringing it back, so probably about 18 months to two years, I would assume, but that I'm sure the city could speak more detail to that as well. So, okay. so if I might ask you, and maybe mm -hmm. you know this and maybe you don't, but am I correct that in bringing that whole area south, like we're talking about, mm -hmm. it kind of mirrors what's already been done by the city of Clearwater from Greenwood up, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So yes, then eventually that whole area of our county would be incredibly improved for our citizens and we, for our businesses and everyone else that we, drives up and down that corridor. Yes, ma'am. We do have the, uh, the North Greenwood CRA will be coming back soon, uh, and that will be the CRA plan approval uh, hearing. Oh, so that should be the end of May. that's the city of Clearwater. That's the city of Clearwater. So that'll be that piece north of downtown. That goes all the way up to the marina on Correct. The spring. Yes, ma'am. And then this will be, you know, the next one south in the city of Largo. But that's Look all part of that, that larger Greenwood uh, nice. area. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Very nice. Thank you. Questions? Anybody else? Just Commissioner mm -hmm. Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. The so this is just the initial. At the next stage, we would get like the kind of itinerary of projects and plans that the city yes, has sir. for that area, mm -hmm. um, and the improvements of of parcels specific and all that. Why why is the uh, CRA? Is it just for geography, or why is it so much in that one parcel, one section of the new expansion, unincorporated? If it's not going to be included. Why is it in the? I'm just curious why it's no, in the map. I, mean, that, I, I think the city probably could speak best to that since they proposed the boundaries themselves. Um, I'd be, I don't know if you guys. Mayor? Mayor? Yeah, absolutely. Please come forward. Good, Good evening. evening. Good evening. Nice to see it's you been here. It's a little while since I've been this far north, so it's nice to see all of you all. <laughs> well, welcome. Um, hello, Madam Chair. I'm going to ask answer that question in just a second, but I want to say hi to the chair and the commissioners here. And uh, thank you for your partnership with the West Bay Drive District, uh, which is an existing CRA with a TIF that we've been doing some great things. Um, I'd also like to point out that our staff is here, including our city manager and our uh, community development director, to answer any questions that I don't have the answer to. Um, the reason that we're looking all the way to the north of Bel Air Road is that's the border of our municipal service boundaries. So that's, that's where... Um, as far as we would go um, if somebody wants to annex in. So, so when we look at long-term planning, we look at those municipal service boundary lines for our planning, whether it's our sewer district or fire service or anything. Um, I'd like to thank your staff for working with our staff over the past several years uh, to get to this point. Uh, we, uh, I'm sure most of you all are familiar with the area, um, whether you're talking about the existing CRA right down Clearwater Lago Road or the eastern side that, that goes 
um, over to, to uh, Missouri. But the question is, why expand? Um, the, the, when we looked at um, looking for a TIF in this area, we realized that the, the, the neighborhoods directly to the east um, had a lot of the same challenges and a lot of the same um, service demands and a lot of the same issues that we saw on Long Clear Largo Road. So, and, and they're right adjacent. We're talking about a half a square mile on one side and a half a square mile on the other side. So we realized, um, and we, we realized that both uh, <coughs> had the same issues and we suspected that the eastern side would fit the definition of a blighted area. Um, so in the 2020 finding of necessity kind of solidified our, our uh, suspicions. 23% uh, of the people in that, in that new district or the expanded area live at or below the poverty line uh, compared to 13% countywide. Um, $24,000 is the median income for that area. Um, $24,000? $24,000. This is in 2020, so numbers change a little bit, especially when I get to housing. Um, but $24,000 is median income. The average for the county, including everybody, so including retired folks and stuff, it's 32,000. So about 75% of the, of the median income. Now housing, again, this is 2020, but in 2020, the median home value, single family home value in that area was $98,000. So just three years ago, you could buy a house in that expansion area for under $100,000. Uh, many of the homes there were about that price point. I can't talk to what it is right now. But <laughs> in 2020, um, the average in the county was 180,000. So we're talking a little bit more than half. Um, so we want to expand the CRA um, to the eastern side of the tracks because we really think that we should, um, and we want to include the, the Jasper Corridor, the Wyatt Corridor, the Auburn Street neighborhoods, and then the neighborhoods both on the east and west side of Missouri as it comes south from, from, uh, from Rosary, really. And, and um, those, those are some of the most demanding or most challenged neighborhoods in our city um, and, those, and the ones that are already in that district. So we want to help those, the, that, that community comprehensively, kind of all as one. And we think this is a great opportunity, opportunity to do that. Um, we want to engage and partner with the county to make sure that uh, there's targeted redevelopment that aligns, aligns with our combined priority of removing blight, um, in, improving public safety, improving community, community pride, um, looking at good housing options um, that are close to quality jobs that, are, that pay well, and good services. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for, for improvement in both of these areas, and we think that we should tackle them as one and work together for one. So we're excited about all the improvements we've seen in the West Bay Drive District, um, and, and we're anxious and excited about the opportunities that exist here. So I'm willing to answer any other questions that you guys have. If I don't have the answer, they do. So thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Justice. Thank you. And yeah, I think I'm excited because I know a few years ago we started talking about this and there was a little bit, a few bumps in the road. So I'm glad we've got to this point. And Some of the bumps are still there. But well, well, that's all right. But we've seen success of TIFs and CRAs all over the county, and so hopefully this will a few years we'll look back and share that. I am curious. The municipal services district is that what you municipal service boundaries boundaries? Yes. Okay. And so in those areas north, you all provide utilities, water, sewer. So some of it, it's it's a mix. A mix. We certainly provide sewer um, in that area. You know, if, if there's. Uh, uh, it's, it's in our fire district, um, and it's, you know, north of Bel Air Road, um, or south of Bel Air Road, if somebody is contiguous with the city, it's a pretty easy process to, to annex. So north of Bel Air Road, same thing for Clearwater. If you're in north of Bel Air Road and, and you want to be a part of Clearwater and you bump up against it, you can easily annex. Uh, so we look at that municipal service boundaries of, uh, this is what we're planning for. Um, the, the north side's easy because it's Bel Air Road. The south side gets a lot more convoluted. So, Mayor, yeah. for clarification, when you say sewer, I am assuming you also mean water. Well, so the, the county provides water for all of our residents. So, so we sanitary sewer, stormwater, our, ours, um, county provides water for all of our residents. So you, you already do that. Right. Yeah. Just double checking for yeah. clarification. And there, and there are some residents in Largo that are on county sewer. 
um, inside our municipal service boundaries, just because there was the historical system along Indian Rocks Road, for example, is is uh, there's a lot of county stuff right in there. Right. Okay. Can I, can I, Commissioner Scott? Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, does that include in your municipal services for uh, police and fire in this area? So, fire, the fire districts are closely aligned with our municipal service boundaries. In fact, they're bigger than because we, we provide fire service to the cities of Bel Air and Bel Air Bluffs. Um, but the rest of those lines are pretty, pretty much right along our municipal service boundaries. Mm -hmm. Our police is within city limits. So, while we have cooperative arrangements with Clearwater, with Pinellas Park, with the sheriff, we all kind of help each other out. Um, our, for our policing district, it's exactly what our city limits are. Okay. Is that the same thing with fire? Nope, fire is, is straight lines. Yeah. It's it's a very it's a, basically the municipal service boundaries, um, with a little bit extra on the east and on the west side. Got it. Commissioners, anyone else? Commissioner, move approval. Second. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please open the board? And a yes. Okay. I'm a yes as well. All right, so that passes unanimously. Congratulations, Largo. Good job. All right. Got a lot of work to do. Go nice. Amen. We all do. All right, so with that said, commissioners, we are uh, in the final throes of our public meeting, and I understand that Commissioner Scott has a point of order he would like to raise. Is that accurate, Commissioner? Uh, I have a few comments that I would like to indulge the board with, if I could. Okay, answer. thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just need to uh, discuss a, a, couple of, a couple of things here. Um, Last, uh, last week at a, uh, at a PSTA uh, committee meeting, uh, there were some comments that were made by a fellow commissioner that serves on PSTA with me that were directed at me and of a very personal nature. Um, as I mentioned earlier in our meeting today, I was unable to attend those committee meetings due to a historic preservation uh, conflict. And as chair of the Historic Preservation Board, that took precedent. <coughs> These comments were made in response to an op-ed authored by me that appeared in local media regarding areas that I feel PSDA can do much better in. My comments on the op-ed page were and remain my opinion. As much as I support public transit, I believe we need to look for other ways to meet our public transit needs. Perhaps it was the first time this commissioner had seen these comments since she was not present at the March PSDA meeting when I brought these items up for discussion and we discussed them at length. So the remarks may have been off the cuff and were perhaps not intended to be disrespectful, but they were, and they were said on the record in a public meeting with a hot microphone. Comments made were that our family business was handed down to me, that I was unqualified and unsuited to serve on PSDA, and that I was fear-mongering and performing in advance of an upcoming board workshop, among other things. And the comments that this commissioner made encouraged other PSDA board members to walk through that door and make comments of their own. Any one of these comments taken individually is unprofessional and unbecoming of a county commissioner. Looked at collectively, this really crosses the line, <coughs> especially that the family business was handed down to me, which not only <coughs> cuts me, but it cuts my parents and my sister, who is also my business partner. All the years of 4 a.m. wake-up calls to clean buses, prepare the fleet and dispatch drivers, the midnight and emergency phone calls that would come in at all hours of the night for last-minute services or emergencies, <coughs> the sometimes 20-hour work days, the times that we would sleep on a couch in the back of the office to get up the next morning and do it all over again, and the decades of 60-plus hour work weeks that my sister, my mom, my dad, and I all put in together to build a family business. And when the time came for my sister and I to take the lead on that business, it wasn't handed to us, we purchased it. And I can tell you that either myself or my sister personally signed every <clears throat> single loan repayment check for 15 years. To suggest anything otherwise is extremely disrespectful to my entire family. You know, we may disagree with each other and we may not vote the same, but we must mutually support each other publicly, even if we disagree. 
I signed up to serve the residents of Pinellas County and not to devolve into political discourse and personal agendas. I have a tremendous amount of respect for everybody on this board. I know how hard it was to get here, and we all had our own journey to get here. We have a collective obligation to the public, and we must treat each other professionally. And I promise you that at no point will I ever engage in personal attacks on fellow commissioners. Thank you for giving me that opportunity, Manager. Thank you, Commissioner Scott. That was very well said. Thank you very much. Um, I would prefer not to ask for comments and opinions because, as you all know from our previous meeting, I've already asked for a meeting with all of us mm -hmm. to hash out these issues, and I believe that they are personal and need to be talked about at a much deeper, larger issue than we are prepared to do this evening. So with your indulgence, Commissioner Scott, especially for you, I do apologize that you have been hurt professionally and personally on behalf of the entire board. And I, therefore, if there's nothing else, I think it's time to adjourn for the evening. Thank you very much, everyone.